Welcome, everyone, to the eighth episode of the Friday Nightmares podcast. I am one half of your hosting team. My name is Heather Powell, and I am coming to you today from Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. And with me, as always, is Scott Crawford coming to you from Sports Creek, Michigan, where it's actually pretty dang nice out, finally. And you can have groups of 10 now. Yes, the state is slowly starting to reopen. Slowly, but it's getting there. It's exciting time because uh, this week, uh, our group sites are still at five, unless it's been raised today. I haven't checked the provincial announcement yet. Um, but we've been able to open retail stores with storefronts today, and you've been able to go in them. Oh, nice. Yeah, so it's, uh, it's working there. And uh, it's so cute. Canada is so different than the States, you know, where they're like, wear a mask. Like our prime minister's like, please wear a mask. I would really like it if you considered one day <laughs> wearing a mask. That would be just really, really nice if you did that. You know, it's such a different like, fucking tone. You, <laughs> you, you Canadians are just so polite. It's so like, if you want to, we would really like that. Because I haven't wore a mask when I go out. Um, now, mind you, I don't go out. <laughs> many places right. um i i haven't stepped foot in a store i think last week i went to a grocery store to pick up pancake mix and that was the first time i had been in a store in two weeks um so there's a lot of like uh doing that whole go grocery gateway which is for us it's delivery of groceries and you know well the lcbo which is our liquor store we all know I like to go to the LCBO. And you got to at least bring it up at least one episode. I know. I always have to talk about my drinking at least on one episode. <laughs> That's okay. That's how I roll. It is what it is. Um, but like, I don't go out much, so I don't feel the need to wear a mask. But if it became mandatory, I would wear one, you know, if it was required. Right. Yeah, because it's I, for right now, I think it's uh, by store mandate here. Mm. So, like, if a certain store says you must have a mask on before you enter, they will not serve you they're allowed to not serve you or anything like that so the gas station right down the road from me like every morning that i go to before i go to work they have a mandatory wear a mask before you come in and apparently someone tried this before but there's even a sign on the door and goes no using your shirt over your face is not allowed so apparently <laughs> someone tried doing that so I, that is so me i'm not someone that would try doing that i feel like <laughs> they made that sign even though I'm not in Michigan right now, because someone like me tried to do that. Yeah. <laughs> I don't like rules at all. Yeah, I, I can understand these rules, but like, even I, like, I, I can't stand wearing the mask, but I do it. Yeah, of course. And as for, you know, I get, I understand the big picture of it. I'm not criticizing, but I totally no. be that person that would forget the mask, show up at the gas station and be like, oh, I'm just going to put my shirt over top of my mouth. But, you know, for the longest time in Canada, like, I don't know, you guys don't do this here, but you could pump gas before paying. So yeah. you pump your gas and then go in and pay for it. And we've switched to like the American model. And my only thought is that we have more people from Michigan Schwartz Creek coming up to Canada and stealing gas. For Michigan and Swartz Creek? Yes, specifically, specifically Shorts, <laughs> Shorts Creek. I feel like that's what's happening. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> it's getting, obviously. Um, but no, we switched that model. We had people stealing gas. Obviously, they were not Americans. They were, you know, your average Canadian just looking to, to steal some gas. But yeah, Save an extra buck. Save an extra buck, right? But yeah, things are definitely beginning to get a little bit more humanized, which is nice. Um, yeah. And yeah, we'll see where things go. But yeah, it's exciting. It's exciting time. So weather's getting better. Happy Memorial Day weekend to my American brothers and sisters. Happy, happy Memorial Day to you, Scott. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, I uh, got let out of work uh, a half day early, which is not normal for this job. But I think it's because of the fact that we're essential workers and the people that are there are still, you know, going in every single day. So I think it's their way our company's just saying thank you. We're getting paid for the half day. Um, and well, we're getting paid for the full day, but only working half the day. And then, yeah, we're getting paid for Memorial Day too. So that's nice. Well, yeah, I think that's, it's just expected here. Like we get our steps paid for, like <laughs> speaking. So I always find it funny when you're like, oh yeah, we get our step paid for. And I'm like, yeah, don't, you know, <laughs> shouldn't you yeah, right. that's paid for? Um, and it's just, it's an interesting, interesting change. But yeah, so happy Memorial Day to, or past Memorial Day, because this will come out past Memorial Day. But I hope uh, all my American friends are, are doing well and, all that kind of good jobs. Yeah, and you can definitely tell it's Memorial uh, Memorial Day weekend uh, here in Michigan because the entire uh, I-75, our expressway, going north 
was completely bumper to bumper my whole way home because they are trying to go all the way up to the UP for their up north vacation. Yeah, right? Well, and the UP is a long drive. I'm surprised they want to go out there just for a weekend. That would not be something that I would well, want to do. It's but... only about a three hour drive to get across the bridge. It's where I went was a lot further the what the story that I told you. But so you can get to a destination within like about four hours. Easily. That still sounds like a really long time for a weekend. Well, I mean, you've kind of did it for coming to visit me. <laughs> yeah, but there's a reason why the border's closed now, because I will never be doing that again. Now that we can oh. afford online, we have no reason. Actually, That's... who knows where I'll be in, the, be in the States again. Our borders are closed at least till June 21st, so we'll see. Yeah, I'll say, here's still, fingers crossed for Fozzie in July, at the end of July, but that, that's getting less and less likely at this moment, but yeah, fingers crossed. Yeah, we'll see what happens, right? Anyway, I think we bullshitted enough. This is a lot of bullshitting that we usually don't go this far into it, so we no, should jump true. into our... <laughs> Our topic at hand. So, um, as always, we like to discuss the uh, the new 2020 movies that we are watching, and then we'll get into our podcast, and then we'll get into our topic. Um, so, I do want to state what our topic is up front. Our topic is about sexualities in films, and we're going to be specifically looking at sexual assault in horror films, um, the progression of it since the uh, the 70s, 80s, 90s, and where we see it going today. And I think I haven't I haven't told this part to Scott, but we probably will include some just some websites about, you know, if you've been a victim of a sexual assault and stuff, because I am very well aware of the fact that this topic could trigger somebody. And, you know, obviously I would want those resources there just in case someone is triggered. Oh, absolutely. Um, and I also want to just take a quick second to acknowledge all of the male podcasters in the Horophilia and Legion Network as a female who is still very new to this um, podcasting community. I have nothing but respect for how every single male has talked about rape revenge films, um, their opinions that have been reflected on it. I think they have handled the topic with a huge amount of maturity, respect, and dignity. All I wanted to do with this topic that was different was come at it from a female perspective. Um, that was the only difference I wanted to bring, but I really wanted to acknowledge and thank every single male podcaster on the Horophilia Network, on the Legion Network, and some independents like Horror for Dummies, Horror Returns, um, particularly the ones that I've listened to that have even v gone into this topic. Every single one of them has handled this topic with so much respect and dignity and compassion. And that really sums up the character of the podcasters that we have in these communities. And we're really lucky to have them. Yeah, I completely agree. So anyway, I just wanted to say that up front. So we'll be talking about that and then we'll be moving into our newest segment, which is Into the Dark. Sounds good. So you, uh, why don't you start with the first movie? Since I'm hosting, Scott, why don't you talk about this awesome movie that we watched? Oh, oh, yeah. Okay. So our first movie that you and I watched, I think we just watched this last Sunday, was yeah. In the Trap. Now we've been getting, I've been hearing uh, good things about this through a couple people in the podcasting community. So I figured this would be a fun one to check out. And yeah, I was not really a fan of this one. It became way too predictable, but it's pretty much about a uh, guy that uh, isolates himself in his apartment and like deals with personal issues and uh, more religious aspects. Mm-hmm. And yet the whole religious uh, tone of this was like in your face. And some of these films like I can get behind, but this one, I don't know. It just didn't work for me. It felt like every other type of film like this that I've seen. And then when the quote unquote twist happens at the end, that once again, Heather called. <laughs> yeah. Was uh, so smart. You so smart. <laughs> but that, I am so sick of that type of twist. Yeah. It's so, and I didn't even understand the ending. Like, I, you know, not to give too, we won't give spoilers, but the ending to me, I was like, what? Really? So nothing else made, like, it just, you know. <sighs> The acting was decent enough. You know, I, I don't think it was a super high budget movie, so I think they used their money well. But I, I, I didn't overly enjoy it at all. It was, it was just there. It was fine. Um, I think we paid for it. Yeah, we did. Yeah, and that's, you know, what I paid for it or recommend people paying for it. No, 
Um, <laughs> unless you're getting it for like one ninety nine. Um, but yeah, it was it was all right. If you need to like buff up your twenty twenty list, maybe. But I think there's other better twenty twenty movies to watch. Yep. Well, the, like from the few podcasters that have really liked it, I would say like it, it would probably be worth the rental if you're into like the exorcism religious mm. type films because mm-hmm. you may find something more enjoyable that you or i did not get from it that's a really good point yeah yeah but yeah it was it was just okay so our next movie is scare me so scott oh, man. suggested this movie so scott and i um have our weekly sunday nights where we watch 2020 movies and we will scott is very good at researching to find out new 2020 movies that come out and he was like oh one of the podcasters that we know spoke about this and um you know we should we should check it out i've heard it's pretty decent so he watched it for free i had to pay for it which is fine Um, that sometimes happens with him and i with me being in canada and him being in the united states um it was definitely a entry filmmaker film. Yeah, this was like really low budget. But it was not the worst movie I have ever seen. When it first started, it starts off pretty cheese cheese. Yeah, it, it started off almost like a porno. Or it started off like Scott and I got a camcorder and we decided to get our friends together and make a movie. Yeah, and like when as soon as it started, I pretty much sent Heather a message going, "I'm so sorry I suggested this because it yeah. just like if this is how this film's gonna be, we are in trouble." We sh- I, I shamed him a bit um, because that's that's the relationship we have. <laughs> but you know, it's an anthology, and the stories weren't that bad. I feel like what they did was the wraparound was low budget, but the stories they actually used their money wisely yeah yeah and and they put good effort in yep i completely agree because yeah the wraparound was very cringy especially the first half of it like the later half it got more interesting Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. was more enjoyable but man for that first half i thought we were really in trouble and then when that first story hit like it really pulled us both in and yeah i think there's like three or four stories besides the wraparound and yeah, each story was pretty good on its own. And then, like, the wraparound itself kind of picked up its pace a little bit towards the end, which definitely helped it for me. I would say, and there was one gentleman in there whose acting stood out to me, who I think has potential. Um, the rest of them, I think that's great that they got some experience and maybe they'll get better. But there was one guy in particular that I was like, you got some talent. I could see you going forward. Yep. Um, you know, yet again, know your expectations. I think if you go into this knowing that it is a low budget, definitely somebody's like first kick at the can with, with filming, um, you will be not disappointed. The, rap, the, the mini stories are great for what they are. The acting in them is decent. There's, there's one really good one that I liked that I was kind of political, and I thought that it was really well done. Um, yeah. That one was really good. You know, I, I know I like politics now. It's, and it's not over politicky, but it definitely ties into um, Black Life Matters. Like, yep. definitely. Um, so, yeah, I was really, really happy with that. Um, yeah. Yeah, there is one stipulation that we should uh, say. Apparently, there are two movies out this year called Scare Me. And this mm. is where we weren't sure which one the person that we were talking to suggested. Um, so for anybody that's interested in the one that we're talking about, it has like a purplish pink neon cover with a skull with glasses. The glasses are cool too. The glasses are, you know, actually instrumental throughout the film. And I get again for a low, go in this knowing your expectations. It's low budget. Um, think of it like a student film, you know, like somebody getting their first kick at the can. And I think you won't be disappointed. I'm happy I paid for it because I feel like these guys put a real effort forward and I'm happy to support that. Yeah, same. That, like, like I said, I was a little bit worried in the beginning, but then once it started going, though, I was, you know, I was perfectly fine with it. It was uh, worth the rental. And it had some g- good elements to it. And like you said, this is a good way to watch to learn how to do an independent film. Absolutely. And I, I had no problem supporting these guys. Like, if I had to choose between this and Wakefield Project, this was much better. Like, night yeah. and day oh, better. Yeah. And, and I think Wakefield had more money than Scare Me did. 
and I just think Scare Money or Scare Me just used their budget better. They just knew how to use the money where it counted. Yep, they definitely did. Yeah, and the the next movie you and I ended up watching, uh, this one we watched this last Sunday as well, was uh, Bit. And we thought about this movie. We we kind of did, actually. And we didn't kind of did. We thought about this movie. Yeah. yeah, so if you hear this, Nudie, there's one that I don't agree on. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you talk about it, this guy, and then I'll chime in. All right, so uh, pretty much this uh, was about a... As far as I could tell, a female version, all female version of Lost Boys. Yeah, that's a good way to describe it. Yeah, and yeah, it was definitely a bit lower budget. I wouldn't say like super low budget, mm-hmm, but like, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. like you could just tell just by the way it looked that there was like you know wasn't a lot put lot of money invested into this. But yeah, all around like at first like it it grew on me, but at first it felt like just kind of. Uh, generic vampire story that i've seen a million times but then as heather and i were arguing and discussing back and forth at the same time like she brought (laughs) up some points that made more sense to me and like she even said okay what is it that you do not like about this and i'm like okay it's kind of hard like i i think what it was is just i uh this one just didn't connect with me nearly as much as it did with you there was like and i can't say there was anything actually wrong with the film and I think, you know, Tammy talked about this on the horror, on the Rotten Round Table. And actually, I think she brought it up with you on that episode. And yeah. she, she said, females may like this more. Yeah. Because it is very female-centric. It is based um, within the LGBTQ. Community. LGBTQ. Thank you, community. Um, and it's, to me, it's the same quality of a Hulu into the dark. If you yeah. like all of the Hulus into the dark ones and I've only seen a couple and I liked both like I liked After Midnight and I liked Valentine I thought that they were fun fluffy easy to watch this to me could be a Hulu into the dark yeah and that that is pretty much right when you said that is when it like oh this okay this makes a lot more sense now to me you know I would never put this in top 10 for me it it would not fall there because I don't think that it is that overly well done but i thought the young ladies did a good job i thought it was interesting that they came to it from a different perspective um i thought the effects were very hulu like it was very hulu effects like i kind of felt like i was just watching valentine again only slightly different you know with vampires and stuff and that's okay you know i i definitely think it's worth the rental i paid how much did we pay for it uh, I'll say I'm not sure what you paid for, but I ended up paying seven dollars for it. Yeah, I I think I paid seven as well. I have no regrets. Um, I did it first, but then as we were talking, I was like, okay, like th- this was fine. It, it was worth the rental. Yeah, I you know I think that definitely I would say rent it if you really like the Hulu Into the Darks, all of them. Yeah. If you if you're like mm, I only like one or two, it may not be something that you want to watch. But if you were like me and you thought the Hulu Into the Darks that you've seen are fun or fluffy easy watches and you want something that's an easy fluffy fun watch go for it yep exactly that is a great way of just saying it so the next one is swallow and i swear to you scott i read this and all i could think was swallow fall, <laughs> worry about and like start singing Sing with my love <laughs> right god you can tell what year we were born yeah. um great movie now is it horror question mark what do you think scott uh, yeah, this one was a, probably, this could have totally fit in our, is it horror category, like, if we had seen it, like, back then, when we did our first episode, because, yeah, this one is a tough one that could be debated over and over again, but I think, uh, I think it is. It's on that border, and it leans a little more on the horror side, but I think, but I can't really get into too much detail without, like, spoilers, but I think it's partly to do with the relationship Mm -hmm. that's kind of where i see the horror in it and like yeah it's a theory about a female oppression right it's about female oppression and and this individual trying to take control of her life where she can um and some of the things she does are horrific so i would i would completely understand if someone said to me i don't consider this a horror film yeah i wouldn't argue with them I saw it as a horror film simply because it had themes that speak the Heather language. Oppression, um, societal norms, 
doing something to disrupt societal norms, but in turn creates harm to yourself. It's well acted. It's, it's slow, but it's not slow. Yeah. You know, so you got to really like character development. You really got to really like plot development um, in order to enjoy it. And very realism horror. Like, this isn't like your fantasy horror. I, I, the more I watch different films, the more I'm beginning to learn that there's, there's horror that is based in reality and horror that is reality on steroids. <laughs> yes. And this is very much a horror based in reality. There could be, and there probably are people that do this. Yep, exactly. And why they do it is probably very similar. So it's, it, it, that, that would be probably how I would frame it to people if I thought, you know, if if you liked if you liked uh, Vivarium, you may like Swallow. I think people who like that will probably like Swallow. Yeah, that is a very excellent comparison because, especially for the people that like, also like the, also the people that think Vivarium would be considered horror would probably also consider Swallow horror. Absolutely. And absolutely. Yeah, the, I I highly recommend this movie. It's really high up on my list. I can't remember if it's in my top 10. I don't think it is, but it's like still way up there. And It's in my top 10. And yet again, I think that has to do with me being a female. Right. I really do. Like, and also when I watch this, um, not to give too many uh, spoilers away, um, it really reflected my marriage, um, which was not healthy towards the end of it. And um, I really could understand what the pressures that this one the female character was feeling. So yet again, that personal connection to it is probably what made it more horror for me because I was seeing my life enacted on film. Minus I didn't swallow things like tax and stuff. And I'm not giving too much away there because it's pretty clear if you even read a brief synopsis that that's what happens. Right. Um, I did not do that. <laughs> there were other things in that film that really spoke to me. Yep. And I can see that. And I just looked, and it's my number 11 right now. So that's pretty high. You know, it's like yeah. how After Midnight was high for me as well, only for you it was higher. Yeah, because exa- of the right? personal level connection. Exactly. Um, yeah. And yeah, and I think the next two are ones that you've seen, and I have not. Oh, yeah. So Monstrum is a movie that is currently streaming on Shudder, and I believe on Canadian and American Shudder. Yep. Which is, you know, always magical. So, very, very good film. It is a Korean film. I believe it's Korean. Yes, South yes, Korean, I think. South Korean film. Yeah, probably not from North Korea. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, South Korean film. It is in subtitles. It's a creature feature. Fresh Cuts. Recently, Mike Venom and uh, Don and Ellie did a phenomenal job of covering this movie. I think if you enjoy creature features and you like the whole like quite literally a monster story it's a really good movie it's fast paced there's some excellent action scenes in it yeah there's some cheesy cgi but that doesn't take me out of a movie like i don't care right i I can watch some pretty crappy cgi films and still have a good time with them um i don't think it's at all you know detrimental to the film i would say if you like creature features you don't mind subtitles you got some time on your hands it's on shutter it's currently not in my top 10, but just above my top 10. So I think 11 or 12, like it's, it's high up. I really, yeah, which really enjoyed it. Has me really excited because that means it may be in my top 10 because like when I watch it, because this already is like the monster creature feature type South Korean film. I'm a big fan of their films, but it also has another level to it that I really enjoy. And that's the period piece mm-hmm. of like the 1500s and stuff like that. So I'm like this this might be high on my list. Like I have this feeling it probably will be. Yeah. And I could see why it would be for anybody. It's a really good film and it's great that it's on a shutter and that it's streaming. And I want to just go back to swallow for a second. That is available on iTunes in Canada. It's not available anywhere else right now. So if you are interested, you need to get it on uh, iTunes. Yep. And for the U S it's on Amazon to rent. So, but yeah, I definitely recommend Monstrum. And I think, yeah, Scott, you will dig it. I think you'll dig it more than me. And, and it's just because I think it's more up your alley, but it is a really well done film. Yeah, I'm looking forward to checking it out. And I'm hoping by this weekend I will, so I can get back to you on it next week or next episode. So like when Scott and I also talk about our top 10, Scott and I have watched 56, uh, I've watched 56 2020 watches. Yeah, but I'm at 54. 
Yeah, so like we've seen a lot of movies, right? So it's something, if we say something's not in our top 10, we're not trying to say it's a bad film. We're just saying it didn't resonate with us the most. Um, by no stance, if it, because it's not, like, if it's in our top 20, I would say it's solid. Yeah, and I was going to say, uh, if it's not in our top 10, that like, and it's like still high up there, the way I look at it, it just means there's a lot of competition with the films we've already seen. Yes, and and we've noticed, like, we're going to actually get a little bit more selective in our watches now, um, especially yeah. if we have to pay for them. Not if they're free, but if we have to pay for them. Um, you know, if they're on Netflix or Shutter or whatever, then that's that's not as bad or Prime. Um, though Prime in Canada sucks. We don't get anything fresh. Well, Prime, Prime in the U.S. isn't much better. Like, we get a lot of, like, someone made something in their kitchen and was able to upload it onto Amazon type films. So oh man. Yeah. Like I used to think prime was going to be sick. And then I would <laughs> turn on some videos. And I'm like, did that someone film this with their iPhone? <laughs> yep. Right. Like <laughs> and a shitty iPhone too, like an iPhone that's like five iPhones ago. <laughs> right. Um, anyway, <laughs> the final one that I want to talk about is get in also known as free. free. Um, and it's 2019. It came out in France it just dropped on Netflix Canada and Netflix America recently. I just watched that this morning and OMG. Um, it went all the way from number 56 to number one on my list. That's it incredible. Hop- <laughs> yeah, it hopscotched over everything else. I, I was so enthralled in this movie that I couldn't look away. And if I did, I would rewind the movie to see what I missed. Oh, wow. And Scott knows how much I don't like doing that. So it's, the basis premise of this is a couple goes away on vacation. They let their nanny and her husband stay in the house for the summer that they own because uh, the nanny and the husband have been evicted. They come back and the nanny and the husband won't let them back into their house. And this is a private residence. It's a gated residence. Um, And they basically have, they they start off with going through these legal battles to get their house back. And then obviously things take a turn from there. And there is some very interesting characters that are in it. The, um, there is some hardcore violence that occurs in it. Um, lots a graphic um, nudity oh, wow. in it. Um, you know, I, I as Scott kindly corrected me earlier, with the exception of Jessica Forever, <laughs> I have yet to see a French film that I have not enjoyed, and I just feel like the French and Spanish seem to really hit it out of the park. Mm -hmm. They just platform blew me away. Um, Therapy blew me away. Blind Sun was an excellent film. Um, I can't remember the other one now, but the one with the three boys. Uh, Among the Living. Among the Living. Like, excellent, excellent films. This one is no exception. Um, it will stay in my top 10, whether it stays number one or not, it will all depend what comes out in the next couple of months. But on Netflix, it is amazing. And I highly, highly recommend checking it out. Yeah, and this is one that I remember briefly hearing about by someone, I forget who, and then you talking about it today. And with you saying it's your number one, yeah, this has got to be watched really soon for me because I am very curious. And to make it easier on Netflix, if you go to Netflix and you click on latest, you can get all of the newest films, so comedies or anything like that that has been released. Um, Makes it a little bit easier to identify those horror films that you may be trying to find. Because Shudder's really good with, like, you go to Shudder and you go to movies, it's usually... Like, like whatever's new category. is, yeah, top category. Netflix, you kind of have to dig a little bit. Um, I'm currently watching a Hindi film. It's okay. Um, but you really got to like Bollywood. <laughs> it's like a lot. Um, very Bollywoody. Um, but definitely with this other one, like I, if I could find it on DVD, I would own it that's how much and i don't buy physical media yeah i was gonna say and that's saying something because yeah you don't buy physical media at all 
at all. I have zero interest in doing that, but I will be heartbroken if I can't find a way to buy this movie and have it again. Yeah, because I think the only I'm other the only other movie I've heard you say that about was Live Live Scream. Live Scream, Mother of Monsters. I think anything in my top ten, I would have as physical media. Yeah, that's pretty good reason to be in top ten. Right. And yeah, that that uh, Hindi one is that a twenty twenty one or is that just? It's uh, a twenty twenty. Oh, nice. It's called Psycho. Um, and it's okay. It's long though. It's two and a half hours. Oh boy. So I'm gonna see if it gets to like if they start dancing and stuff in it. I don't know if I'll be able to like. <laughs> handle that my uh my my ex-husband was south asian so i've seen a fair amount of bollywood films with my ex-in-laws so um yeah we'll see we'll see where it goes from here right makes sense um so yeah i guess that'll be the end of the 2020 list and we can uh jump into the older films like up top is a lot of the ones that you watched so i'll go down to the to a couple because it doesn't look like i watched nearly as many older films as you have yeah, you haven't uh, watched that many movies. Surprisingly, yeah, like work has just been a little bit more busy, and then I got distracted a couple days by watching YouTube videos instead, just because I wanted enough. to switch it up. Fair enough. But uh, yeah, I guess the first one I want to bring up, uh, Pony Pool from two thousand and eight. Man, I have been told to watch this movie multiple times by multiple different friends of mine and podcasters, and I've heard another couple. Uh, Cinema Psyops, I'll give a shout out there. Uh, Court Psyops and Matt Psyop covered Pony Pool, and that that was what really sold me on wanting to see this film. And when I seen it was playing on Amazon Prime, I knew I had to like watch it. And what a freaking amazing movie. Like, it's low budget, so it's like a small cast, uh, all in Canada. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. That's what you were telling me about. Yeah, in the town of Pontypool. And what a very unique take on the zombie genre. Like, this is probably the most unique zombie film I've seen in a very, very long time. Especially the way people are infected. Mm. Like, it's 12 years old, so I can get into it a little bit. But pretty much the English language is certain words in the English language will infect you. And it's very weird, but very unique. And it deals with these people that work in a radio broadcast station and they're doing like their morning radio show and they're hearing about the instance that's happening outside the world. And it's pretty much, the, it's just what's going on inside the radio station. Like you don't see the outside world or what's going on out there. So very- like that sounds low, really cool. Yeah, it's like low budget, but like once again, they use their budget perfectly that's amazing and it is creepy and yeah like i say it's a very well done movie like this this is a 10 out of 10 film for me and you know oh, i don't wow and i don't give out 10 out of 10s lightly and th this one i was just like yep this i have nothing wrong with this film it is just awesome and i would i would own this that's amazing you know you made me want to go back and start talking about get in again god <laughs> i love that movie <laughs> oh my God. He's a 10 out of 10. I'm like, that movie too is a 10 out of 10 for me. Like, I want to go back in time and just continue to talk about this and, movie because I loved it so much. And that's kind of how I am with Pony Pool. So, that means right? I watch Get In, so you and I can discuss it like crazy. And then you watch Pony Pool, and then you well, and I, I can discuss it. Well, I got it. It's a Canadian movie. You right, know, exactly. like, if I don't, my citizenship's going to be revoked. Right, uh, exactly. You have to do this. <laughs> but yeah, that sounds really awesome. It sounds like it. I love when, you know, you can be low budget and use your money well. And and you know you you knock it out of the park and it's awesome. Yeah, awesome. yeah. Like this is better than a lot of the big budget films that I've seen. You know, like like movies like The Turning. Like what a waste of money. Yeah. What an absolute or The Grudge. What a right. waste. You know, if some of these movies that don't have the budget but were so much better had that budget, think about what they could have done. Oh, absolutely. You know what I mean, like, like especially if you had the like. The per like the right script writers for the for it and everything like if you had everything perfectly like these indie f like some of these really good indie films do like i would love to see and just the money yeah like, all they need is the money <laughs> but well and there's one thing i want to bring up too like with the indie and big budget i see an issue that always happens with these big budget films where when they have all these millions of dollars to spend they lose certain filmmakers lose their creativeness 
because when you are working with a much smaller budget, you are forced to get creative. Yeah, that's a good point. So I, I feel like a lot of big budget films lose that because they just have all the money in the world to spend on it. Yeah, I think you make a really good point there. I, yeah, that's, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so I guess we'll keep kind of around that same year. I'll talk about The Collector. Uh, nice. First time watch for me, heard a lot about it, seen, seen the cover art for years, never got around to watching it. Like talk about a movie where the villain becomes the, or the antagonist becomes the protagonist. Yeah. Right. And then it's just, it's a gore fest. Oh my goodness. And not a happy ending at all. No. Uh, so really enjoyed it. Really well done. I haven't watched the collection. I think it is. It's a, yeah. it's a sequel. Yeah, so I would like that one even more. So I'm going to watch that one eventually too. But yeah, I would say if you skipped over this movie and you like saw or you like any kind of, um, I don't want to say torture porn because people aren't, well, there's traps and stuff like that. So I guess maybe you could call it torture porn. Yeah, I'd call um, this like a torture porn home invasion film. Yeah, I think that's a good, yeah. Or what was that other movie that came out um, about the blind dude who's guarding his oh, house? Oh, Don't Breathe. Don't breathe. I was going to say don't blink, but that's another movie. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of don'ts out there. Yeah. But yeah, if you like don't breathe, I, I would say the collector may have inspired don't breathe a little bit. Like to, to me, there is some similarities. Obviously they're not the same movie, but right. there's a little bit of a similar, you know, going into a house and booby traps and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, it was, it was really good. Enjoyed it. And I believe I watched it on Shudder. So it should be on Shudder Canada. Yeah, but I can't remember. I think it's on the uh, U.S. shutter as well, but I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, but yeah, the uh, next one, since we'll just go with like the years pretty much, I'm going to do Stakeland from mm. 2010. Now, this one I have avoided because of the title. It just sounded corny and cheesy, and I'm like, okay, the, I, I won't wa waste my time with this one. And then I started hearing people talk about it and like talking about it highly, and I'm going, Okay, now I'm curious, and I seen it was on Shutter, so I decided to give it a watch. And yeah, don't take this title seriously. Just uh, just go, just check it out because it's a really violent vampire movie, and mm. like it's uh some of the and the way these vampires are are horrific. Like really, yeah, they are like terrifying vampires. But yeah, the character development in it is really good. The effects are really good. The story is pretty cool. Um, and it kind of does what I like, which is uh, shows like when this happens and then like the aftermath post-apocalyptic style afterwards, like all in one movie. Like, cause I, there's zombie films that usually would do like, oh, the zombie uh, infestation has already happened. So this movie starts afterwards and it's only post-apocalyptic. I like movies where it shows the incident happening and then the aftermath as well. I like it all wrapped into one film and this one does that. And I highly recommend this. It was a really fun, gory vampire film. Awesome. I remember you told me about this and I was impressed to hear that because I remember hearing about Stakeland as well. And I think I just didn't watch it because I don't know if I had access to it. Like I don't, I remember hearing of it, and, and I think before doing this challenge of first-time watches, and only doing first-time watches, it was very easy to just watch Friday the 13th again for the 18th billion time. Right. Or, you know, watch whatever film is your favorite for the 18th billion time. And I'm not saying that you can't do that, but I just feel like, for me, I will probably no, never go back to doing that again. I will probably always look at doing more first time watches unless something is a tradition. Like I'll be honest, Friday the 13th hasn't changed. I don't need to watch it another time. I really don't like, right. and I'm not, I'm not cutting up people that do, do you do what you want, but it's not like the plot's going to change. Okay. Like I, right. you know, it's going to be the same. And I just feel like I have a better appreciation now for film. I have a better understanding of what goes into making a good movie and I can defend my choices better because I watch more movies. Yep. I'm completely agree. Cause uh, 
Yeah, until you brought this challenge up to me, like the only new, like the only first time watch stuff that I would do would be mainly the stuff that would come out during the year and the occasional older film like that I would try to watch during Halloween because I would challenge myself to watch some films I've never seen before. But other than that, it would just be comfort movies and I would just throw on Sleepaway Camp 1 and 2 or Friday the 13th or whatever just because they're comfort. I know them. They're familiar. Nothing wrong with that. I love doing that. But I, I agree with you. I think from here on out, I'm going to stick to watching as many first time watches as I can. Maybe like if I ever have that like urge, like, oh, you know, I would really like to see the thing again just because it's been a while. Sure, I'll throw it on. But like, I, I, I think mainly I'm just going to stick with first time watches though because I'm loving just like learning about these films that I have missed and kicking myself for a lot of these films that I've missed. Absolutely. And I feel now I have a much better chance of winning trivia next year. <laughs> yes. If there's another tournament, um, I watched one movie we'll get to Miss 45 later. And I, my trivia question was about Miss 45. Mm -hmm. And I guess the movie was the shopkeeper, which I just made up in my head. Um, now I get, if I had seen Miss 45 beforehand, I would have said Miss 45. Um, yeah. you know, and it just, yet again, like, and I would never say to people either, oh, you need to watch more movies to be cultured. Like, I don't, right. you do you, right? But like, for me, the benefit of watching these films that I missed over or I didn't watch because I looked at it and I went, mm, I don't like the cover art or, mm, oh, that doesn't look interesting. Now I just hit play. Yeah. Yeah, but I'll like, I sometimes still go by cover art because, you know, when I'm going at work, I'm trying to like just kind of scroll through real fast. So if there's something that catches my eye, that's the one I'll hit play on. Or if it's just a title that I've heard someone talk about a lot and be like, you know what, I'll give this a chance finally. Yeah. But yeah, there's, you know, I've, I've found some turds amongst them, but like I still have not regretted any of my watches. Even the worst film I've watched, I don't regret watching. But even when you watch a bad movie, it allows you to figure out what makes that movie bad. Yeah, exactly. Like if someone said to me, what makes Jessica forever bad? I would say the plot is basic. There's no real character development. You never exactly figure out why they're doing what they're doing. And it's overly artistic with no content. Yeah. You know, that's how I would describe it. I wouldn't just be like, well, it sucks. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> Like now, now you have a reason and a basis for like why you like films and you learned uh, and you'll start to realize, oh, well, this is a genre that I never thought I was going to like in horror. And, well, you start and I appreciate that too. the low budget to the high budget and how people use their money. If there's yeah. anything that I have grown to appreciate, it's here's, you know, you get a budget of money and there's a lot of work that goes into making a film. It is hard work where, where you know, we'll get into in the out of the dark about the film festival that we're currently both viewing, but I watched a couple of films from that and I saw people on the side just chewing it up. You know, this is shitty. You know, it's super, it's like when people watch NFL and they played high school football and they think that they get it. Yeah. You know, like, or you watch the, the, a hockey team and you played junior A and you think that you get it. That's my Canadian reference for all my Canadian listeners. Like, it's hard to do those things. It's hard to make a movie. So people that actually get the balls to try to do it, I have a lot of respect for. Oh, same here. I have double the respect when you do it well. Yep. Right? Exactly. And, yeah, whose movie is it now? I think it's yours now? I think it's mine. So I'm going to go back in time to The Gollum 1915. Hmm, nice. That's right. 1915. Uh, over a hundred years old. Um, so I, of course, heard about this because Scott got this trivia answer question right on his trivia. Amazingly. <laughs> Amazingly. He, like, pulled it out of his bum. But he managed to do it. And I, and I was going through Shudder I, one night this week. And I was like, oh, the Gollum. Well, this will make me look impressive on the podcast. So I decided <laughs> to watch it because I'm all about the prestige. So, You're such a dork. <laughs> it's true, though. Like, I, people, like, I'm a nice person, but I care about prestige. Like, I'm so multifaceted and odd that way. But anyway. Um, wow. Like, for 1915, what a piece of history. 
you know, it's a silent film and the music in it is like, I go back to thinking about, they would have had to record the music live and then paired it up with the film, the camera angles they were using, incredible for 1915. The, the shading, because obviously it's in black and white, but it's shaded. It has some color in it, but the shading, oh my God, like, and the expression of it being silent and communicating thoughts was incredible. You know, I, it's about 60 minutes long, um, 125 actually with like some cutout scenes because they're pasting it together because I guess the original film was lost and they're just pasting it all together as it goes. So, you know, it's not the clearest story in the entire world. Like, it, you know, spoiler, it's, it's basically about a gentleman that brings back a golem to, re- to seek revenge. It's very Frankenstein monster-ish. Um, but it's worth the watch. You know, if you are a horror fan and you care about the history of the genre and, and where we got our, our, com- our startings from, I think that it's worth your time to sit through this movie um, and appreciate it for what it is. Yeah, this is one that I really would like to check out, especially after the trivia. I was like, okay, this, I need to find this movie. And yeah, just, just to let everybody, all the listeners know, it's on Canada Shutter. This one is not on the U.S. Shutter. Uh-huh. Yeah, this one I like. I did find it though. For anybody that is interested, it is streaming free on YouTube, and there is a lot of silent horror films on YouTube streaming, which is nice. So yeah, I will be watching that soon, and I'll be looking forward to watching that one because yeah, that one really sounded like right up my alley. And so yeah, the uh, next one because apparently I'm just staying in the newer films this last t- this uh, go around. You mean you're not going back to 1915, Scott? <laughs> <laughs> nope. Everything I've watched in this uh, last couple of weeks has been 2000s and up. I haven't watched anything older than that, apparently. Oh. Uh, so the next one I am going to watch, or watch, uh, talk about is The Den from 2013. The reason I ended up watching this one was because the exploding heads on their, uh, I'm a Patreon on there, and this was one of their more recent episodes. And they covered The Den, and I had never heard of this film, and it actually sounded pretty uh, interesting, so I wanted to give it a check it, uh, check it out. And I found out it was playing on Hulu, so I went to Hulu, found it, gave it a watch. Man, this was a really good found footage film. Yeah. Like, yeah, it was really, uh, really freaking creepy. But it's uh, basically about a woman that wants to do a study for her work on like those chat roulettes or those Russian roulette chats where you're just getting paired up with some random stranger and you guys got to just start talking and you can skip forward and move to a different person if you don't like the conversation. And just like in those types of chats, like she'd be kind of going through and like click on an image and all of a sudden it'd be a guy. And as soon as she pops up on the screen, he would take his pants off and just wag his dick around. So she'd skip. And just like a lot of perverts that she'd have to deal with on there. Yeah, she's going through and she comes across a uh, chat where a person ends up getting killed on the screen. And it like freaks her out. Well, basically, this is a story about be careful what you're doing on social media. And bad things start happening and following her and following her friends and stuff like that. And it just gets creepier and creepier and creepier. And man, all I can say is become a Patreon for exploding heads, pay the $3 a month and check out if you're Canadian or four, if you're Canadian (laughs) and uh, check out, I think it is episode one Oh five where it's the den, the, the void and bone tomahawk and listen to their review because they do a phenomenal, phenomenal job covering this film man we blow exploding heads so bad we so do <laughs> like it's dave z i only think it's dave z saying i blow this movie and they blow this movie yeah we blow your podcast dave z that's we, what we do here on friday nightmare <laughs> well we blow all <laughs> we blow all of our friends that are in the podcasting community that we we support that sounds really great scott <laughs> <laughs> Heck yeah that- Maybe the wrong choice of words or I hope you right leave that choice. In there. That was amazing. Oh, yeah, yeah. Please, please leave that. Let's see if oh, we get more viewerships that way. That's awesome. Of course. Of course I'll leave that in there because, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm not even going to go there. I'll stop. <laughs> yeah, I think she should stop now. We're not on It's Not Horror. Um, all right. So I guess I'll move on then, too. 
Keeping on social media, I'm going to jump ahead. I watched this movie called Cam from 2018. And, you know, it's funny how social media has led to the development of so many movies. You know, oh, so know. horror movies, right? So Cam is basically about Cam girls, about one particular Cam girl. And let me tell you, I learned a lot about Cam girls. Like, <laughs> I, uh, it's a really interesting profession. So for people that aren't aware, Cam girls are um, individuals that identify as female who choose to um, film themselves and will perform whatever someone wants, and they get tip money. So it doesn't necessarily have to be sexual. It could just be talking. It could just be, it could be baking cake. It could be anything actually for that matter. It's about voyeurism. And this movie really explores, um, you know, very much a supernatural computer geared thing of what can happen with uh, these online systems. And I think that the girl that was starring in it was the same girl from Truth or Dare and, and um, Fantasy Island. She's also, I think, from Pretty Little Liars. Oh, okay. Yeah, I know I her. I know her name, but yeah. I've seen her in tons of stuff. She's not bad. You know, the acting in this is is very much um, your basic acting, uh, teeny kind of boppy film, but it's definitely more sexual. You don't see too many boobies, but you you know there is some very sexual things that are talked about in the film. Um, especially when it comes to orgasming and dildos and sex toys and all that kind of stuff. So it's on Netflix. It's on Netflix Canada. And if you enjoy social media movies or you want to learn more about the webcam girl industry or <laughs> some really like extreme of what could go wrong, I would recommend checking it out. Yeah, because this is one that I've been curious about because I've heard a couple others talk about this as well. And then with you saying you really liked it, I'm like, all right, yeah, this will be one I'll have to watch at some point. Um. So the next one that I am going to talk about was uh, the sequel that I talked about, the original one, just last episode of the episode before, but uh, Creep 2. And wow, once again, this, another movie in like the sequel to this movie, just as good as the first film. Like I really dug the crap out of this one. And like it had a little more of a dark humor to it. Like the first one had some dark humor to it, but this one like, even had a little more which i i love the character and i think i said his name wrong last time but uh the director screenwriter and actor was mark duplass i think i said joe duplass or something like that mm. in the last episode but uh yeah he's back in this as the killer in this film and he once again like hires someone on to do like a documentary style film for him and this time it's a woman that does these uh youtube videos of and she calls like she has a youtube channel called encounters where she just meets random people online that are just kind of lonely or depressed or are unique and like she just goes and interviews them and hangs out with them and does whatever they ask like to an extent like one guy's like obsessed with being treated like a baby so she's holding him and give feeding him a bottle and stuff like that and she, uh this one she gets she sees the call from the killer and She's like, oh, we'll go check out what he wants. And like right off the bat, like this time around, he's not hiding anything. And he just straight up says, I'm a serial killer. And then it's the whole, okay, is he telling me the truth or not? But I love the idea behind this one because not only like he's gotten to the point where he's a 40 year old man that is going through a midlife crisis where he's just like, I just, I just don't have the earth, like, these urges to kill like I used to. It's just really bothering me lately. And he's like, I'm losing inspiration on the on how to do these kills. He's like, so I'm looking at like Francis Ford Coppola and seeing how he did his films and how he's like, you know, my masterpiece was this film. But you know what? I'm going to keep making more films and keep trying. Maybe I'll hit that success again. And he's like, and that's kind of what I want to do. And it's just, but it's him talking about being a serial killer. And it like- That's interesting. Yeah, I was like, I really thought this like, story was very unique and kind of a interesting take on the whole thing and the dialogue between the two of the characters in this movie because that's, that's all there is, is these two characters the whole entire film and the dialogue between them is just fascinating and entertaining and like she gives it right back to him where he doesn't even know what the hell like how to react to her or anything and it just yeah they bounce off each other perfectly and their chemistry is great like this is a high recommend as well like nine out of ten for me 
Um, wow, 9 out of 10. That's hard for you. Yeah. And the first one was a 9 out of 10 as well. And they're both playing on U.S. Netflix. So hopefully Canada's Netflix has it so you can eventually watch these. Hopefully. One can hope. You never know right? Canada's Netflix. <laughs> up in the air poor scott so anyway scott has five cats and this one cat um i think it's stormy keeps walking yep. in front of him and sitting on his lap right now and it's pretty funny he just keeps moving her and she keeps coming back it's like pet cemetery at scott's house <laughs> yep she just never leaves me alone all right eventually the cats are just going to take over be a haiku of all the kitty cats <laughs> overtaking <laughs> scott and well just because mark nato loves to pick on me yes mark nato mr biff is around Yep, Mr. Biff is around, that's true. If Stormy's there, <laughs> then definitely Mr. Biff will be there too. Yep. I don't have as many movies to talk about remaining. I think I may just talk about 13 and 14 cameras together. So I, I watched 13 cameras and 14 cameras, mostly because I listened to its uh, Horror for Dummies. Shout out to Horror for Dummies. Uh, they did a great um, little thing on kids on bikes. Oh my God, it's so funny. Yeah. It's so good. Um, Anyway, they, uh, Daniel, Mr. Luffy, has uh, seen 13 cameras, and he, and he talked a little bit about it, and I thought, oh, I'll watch it, and I enjoyed it, but he's right. The, the main dude in it is a total mouth breather. He just kind of, like, breathes out loud for the entire movie. Oh, like the um, antagonist? Yeah, and he looks like he hasn't, like, showered in, like, 18 years. Oh, he's years. gross. Like, it's so, like, the actor does a really good job of coming across as a complete, like, freaking creep you know like you would look at this dude and be like oh my god <laughs> like he's creepy um so 13 cameras definitely flows into 14 cameras so i would strongly recommend watching 13 cameras before you watch 14 cameras now you can tell when they made 13 cameras they weren't planning on making a sequel okay right i find this a lot with a lot of horror movies and venom actually talked about it in the most recent fresh cuts episode is that a lot of american films will sometimes leave it open and they did leave it open but i don't think they planned for it because sometimes when they make sequels to this film to these films you're like oh my god like it's not as good as the original you know right. and i would definitely say 14 cameras isn't as good as the original is it decent and entertaining to watch absolutely but is it as good as 13 cameras not so much but I would say if you do watch them back to back, it's which I did, it's it's a smooth uh, ride, and it will probably make more sense. Okay, because yeah, I'm actually three quarters of the way through 13 cameras right now. Okay, cool. And yeah, because I was watching it today at work, and then I came home and just haven't had a chance to finish it off before we recorded. But I'll be finishing that one to, probably tonight, and then watch 14 cameras like sometime shortly after that, just just because to watch them both, why not? And besides the Gross mouth breather antagonist. Man, the husband in this film. Oh, I can't stand him. <laughs> yeah, he's not really a nice dude, huh? But like, oh, he's a piece of shit. You know, though, it's funny because he talks about like the marriage thing in there, and and there's a line where he's like, you know, we met. She wanted to get married, and I think a lot of couples fall into this. We met. We had a good time. She wanted to get married. We got married. Um, she got pregnant, and now everything changed. Yep. And I on like not to get into too much marriage counseling, Heather here, but I think that that's pretty common. I think a lot of times people meet, they have a good time, but they don't actually look to see if they have the same things in common or expect that things are going to change. And having a child is like the most difficult you thing you can do with somebody. Yes. Is try to raise a another human being so i think they do a good job in this movie of reflecting that so as much as he's a he's a jerk i do understand when he kind of goes into that diatribe of how people get themselves in that situation it doesn't make it okay what he does but i do understand how people will end up in those situations yep exactly like i've been there for mm -hmm. the most part for the most mm -hmm. part mm -hmm. minus the nice big mansion house if, right where the with big a, pool with an in-ground oh, pool oh with the, oh how, how i would love a pool <laughs> yeah no kidding right it's just you didn't want to clean it and do the work for it you just want it to be there yeah exactly because <laughs> that's a lot of work it is a lot of work uh so yeah i guess i'll just talk about uh one more film and i will do the clove pitch killer from 2018 now if you've seen summer of 84 you've seen a version of the story that is Clove Hitch Killer. Because <laughs> they both came out right around the same time, like in the same year, but just like right around, like within a couple months of each other. And I think we're pretty much filmed like almost the exact same time. So there's like no way they copied each other. 
But yeah, this one. Is this like, what is it? The burning in Friday the 13th too? Kind of, yeah. Is this like the same thing? Oh, cool. Yeah, kind of in that way, like in that aspect, except for this one's not based in the 80s. I think it may be either 90s or a little more current. So they're not like, look at the 80s. Look at my hair. It's the 80s. Yeah, exactly. Oh my God, it's the 80s. Okay. Yeah, and actually, now that I'm thinking about it, yeah, I think it's more modern. I think it's more mm. of a modern take on it. But uh, yeah, and, uh, this one, instead of like in summer of 84, where the kids are like, oh, is the neighbor a killer? Let's let's kind of figure it out. This one is, is my dad a killer? <laughs> and like the whole, let's try to figure this out. <laughs> <laughs> Same idea. <laughs> yeah. I love and, it. But yeah, this one is, I would put it up there right with uh, summer of 84. Like if you like that film, you'll like this one. Uh, this one's a bit shorter on the runtime, so it, it's better paced for me. So mm. I think I might like it a little better. Um, but yeah, if you are a fan of that type of film, like uh, Summer of 84 and the like, then you probably will enjoy this. Nice. I The only one that we watched together was From Dark, 2014. We didn't watch it together, but we actually watched that one. Oh, yes. Dark. Yeah. Yeah. So it, this one is a is a creature feature. Yep. And I think it's Australian, isn't it? Or is it British? Sorry. I think it's Australian. Okay. So yeah, I think it's Australian too. And so I guess it would be considered... Aussie exploitation, uh, which I'm like, I'm just using that like term now because I because <laughs> now we know what it is. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> now Derek told me Derek B from uh, Cinema Attacks and No More Room in Hell and a bunch of other podcasts. Um, he he was the one that coined that term, and now I get it. But yeah, it's it's a total Aussie creature feature film, and it's not bad. Like, it's not a bad film. It's entertaining. Yeah, yeah. Um. My only complaint, like I have a complaint about this with a lot of horror films, but this complaint is so first world problem. And that oh, yeah. is, and that is I'm watching it on my phone and everything's filmed in the dark for the most part. Oh, so it's yeah. very hard to see on my phone, like what I have especially pushed back. So my, that's like, my, that's my complaint to myself. Well, that's like, you well, watching it though. Yeah. On a forum, forum. Yeah. yeah this is my own bad, fault. Right? Why it like, it's not against the movie, but yeah, this yeah. movie was pretty creepy. Like, the monster in it was kind of frightening. Um, the things that it could do, uh, and kind of like, and it was pretty fast paced too. It was pretty fast paced, and like it kind of left at the ending, not knowing what was going to happen. Yeah. Would you consider that a Lovecraft movie? I was thinking about that because I remember you brought that up, thinking it might be. I don't know if I'd call that Lovecraft. Okay. See, I don't. I just consider everything. I don't really get Lovecraft um, right. there's creatures in it so I don't know where the line is so I'm glad that you clarified that yeah I, I would say this one's like I would say close to it but I wouldn't consider it one you know which one I thought was and I'm just going to mention it quickly Island Zero 2018 it's on Prime um, it's based out of these creatures uh, attacking this fishing village in Maine mm. I thought that was Lovecraft but I think if you watch it you can tell me Okay. Or the listeners can watch it and tell me. It's free on Prime. It is low budget with its acting and everything. Um, not the worst low budget money movie I've seen, but definitely low budget. Um, slow burn. And the creatures made me think of Lovecraft. Okay. But, yeah, I'll, have to, I'll have to give it a watch and see. Because I, I, I read the synopsis last night when you said you were watching it. And it sounds interesting. Yeah, I think you would dig it. Like I was, I was lukewarm on it. It was fine. Um, it was no color out of space, you know. Which even right. though I am not a Lovecraft fan, I respect that movie. Yeah, because that was just a well-made film. Well-made film, entertaining, well done. This was fine, you know. I think I, I'm just curious if you do watch it, you can tell me whether it's Lovecraft or not, because I have no idea. Okay, I will. I'll do that. Uh, yes, I guess uh, that will be the end of our what we've been watching. And we can just uh, jump into what we've been listening to. Yeah, absolutely. So what I just started listening to is Chilling Tales for a Dark Night, a horror anthology. So similar to the, um, the scary story ones that I talked about a couple weeks ago, this one is also a horror anthology, but it's more adult themed. 
Okay. So they have, they'll say more, you know, not that it's like sexual or stuff, but they'll, they'll use more sexual terms in it. They also use some language in there that some people may or may not find offensive. So for example, they use the word retarded. Ah. And I personally try not to use the term retarded. Uh, I don't, you know, I would never, if someone used the term retarded with me, I would never stop them and be like, oh, you're being offensive. Stop that. You're upsetting me. Um, I choose not to. There are other terms that if someone does use, like any kind of racial slur or homophobic slur, I will stop and and put a clear end to because that to me is is crossing the line. But I think, unfortunately, the word retarded is still very much used in our pop culture and people are trying to learn not to say it. Yeah. So I like to educate more than scold if people use that term because I think it's definitely coming around. So, you know, just as a FYI that those terms are used or other language that maybe someone might find offensive, but they're told by different narrators, which I think is really cool. And I believe it's told by the narrator. The narrator is the person that wrote the story. Oh, nice. So it's a very, very cool concept. It currently only has uh, just over 3,000 followers. But if you enjoy storytelling, especially right now, you know, if you want something to play while you're sitting at the campfire or something like that, it might be totally worth a listen. So check it out. It's on Podbean. And we'll include the link to it in, um, in our show notes. Yeah, I will be definitely subscribing to these guys because I'm curious. I want to hear this. Um, but yeah, the one that I am going to talk about um, is The Midnight Drive-In, uh, which is a horror movie, or well, I should just say kind of like cult film review podcast. Like they cover a lot of horror films, but they also cover non-horror cult films and some comedies and stuff like that. But uh, it's hosted by... Brian Wolford, Doug McKinney, who is a fellow Canadian, Heather. Woo! So a Canadian podcaster that you're now going to be now going to be friends with. <laughs> now I got to be best friends with. Um, and then Noah, which I can't remember his last name, but he was uh, a fairly new addition over the last couple of years. Uh, but they usually do two. Uh, well, they do two films. They they review two films that have a theme. So one theme could be, oh, let's uh, watch this, watch these two movies that star this actor, or let's watch these two movies that has a dinosaur wearing pajamas because there's a couple of those movies or something like just something <laughs> random, like some some pajamas. weird tiny little thing that they could <laughs> pick funny. out of a film and find another film with that tiny little thing and they'd be like, yep, that's our theme. They just they're fun about it and they are good at reviewing them they each take their turns talking about the film and whatnot and uh they also do a what, what they've been watching segment and they cover pretty much all film genres when they're talking about what they've been watching because they're nice. comic book nerds they're sports nerds they they talk about everything but, do they talk about magic cards and how they almost went pro nope that's only me because <laughs> in case the listeners really want to know this is, how, this is how cool i am i almost i almost went pro <laughs> There. Now Heather can continue to make fun of me over it. I, I don't make fun of you. I do think it's cool that you did that. I just tease you. <laughs> I know you Remember, do. I only tease people I like, so. Exactly. That's why I like to joke about it, because it's just fun. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, uh, they are back to the podcast. Uh, the Midnight Drive-In can be found on, uh, was it Spotify, iTunes, and most podcast catcher apps. Uh, I'm not sure if they're on Podbean. I will see. And if I can, if they are, I'll get the link there and share it, but I'll also share their other links. Awesome. So we'll take a short break now and we'll hear from one of our fellow podcasters and we'll be back with you shortly. Hey, Andrew. Hey, Maddie. Do you like horror movies? I sure do. Well, did you know that most horror movies are inspired by real-life horror? Really? Like what? Well, take The Shining, for instance. That's based on Stephen King's real-life addictions, or The Purge, which could be our country any minute now. Oh, and The Strangers, which is based on a real-life murder. People should be talking about these things. Hey, 
Guys. Oh, oh hey, Producer, producer Michael. Producer Michael, oh, hi. Well, I hate to break it to you, but somebody already is. It's you. <gasps> That's right. We are Friday the 13th, the podcast where we talk about horror in real life and horror in media, all from an LGBTQ perspective. Because we gay, y'all. We are proud members of the Legion Podcast Network, and we can be found on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, or wherever your favorite podcasts are found. And follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Come along with us on this crazy journey, and as always, get slayed. So welcome to our feature presentation. So right off, I want to acknowledge that this is a heavy topic. I already did at the beginning, and I want to thank Scott for coming on this ride with me. Um, for a long time, I have wanted to talk about rape revenge films. Um, I identify as a female. I, I identify as a heterosexual female. And I, this is a topic that I, I haven't heard a lot of females go into great detail on. I've definitely heard females talk about it. Um, but I wanted to explore the academic side of it and how it affects film. And right off the bat, when I brought it up to Scott, he said yes, but I know that it's a topic that is hard for him for, for clearly, you know, valid reasons why. <laughs> yeah, it's um, not an easy topic to talk about. You know, Scott is a very respectable, kind human being. Um, and I think for any human being, rape or sexual assault is a difficult thing to discuss, especially for a man discussing it for women. So Scott, I want to thank you again for coming on this journey with me um, and for being willing to discuss this and for bringing your thoughts and your knowledge to it. Oh, absolutely. Um, it takes a lot of strength and I really appreciate that. Well, thank you. And yeah, I will, I will definitely uh, be sitting back quietly and listening for a little, little bit of this, I'm sure. Yeah. I, I'm going to do a little bit of the promo stuff. We already kind of broke this out before, um, simply just due to, you know, the, the information that I found was very female centric, but we're going to be taking this in a different route as well yeah. and looking at uh, male sexual assault and that in films as well. So as I said earlier, I understand this could be a topic that could be triggering for some people. I will um, include some resources that I send to Scott for the show notes uh, for individuals if they if they you know listen to this and it does trigger something and they need to um, reach out to somebody. So first thing we're going to look at is the definition of rape. So definition of rape is unlawful sexual activity, usually sexual intercourse carried out forcibly or under the threat of injury against a person's will or with a person who is beneath a certain age or incapable of valid consent because of mental illness, mental deficiency, intoxication, unconsciousness, deception, compared to sexual assault or statutory rape. Um, and then it kind of goes on to some other things of robbing, despoiling, or carrying away with a person by force. So that's the definition that we're going to be working with. Uh, that most, I, think, I would argue that most films use that do rape revenge. Like, I think this is pretty accurate scott would you agree oh absolutely yeah okay um so a great article that was written by a phd student at the university or western uh university university of western ontario is about rape revenge films so this woman wrote uh, a thesis statement so a thesis uh, dissertation i should say a day of the woman Feminism and Rape Revenge Films. So she wrote this back in 2012. And what she actually did is she did a comparison between The Last House on the Left of 1978, I believe, and then I Spit on Your Grave in 1972. Or no, Last House on Your Left in 1972, Spit on Your Grave in 1978. Am I messing up the years I, there? I think that's right. Yeah. And then followed up by the remakes. So this wrote writer looked at the narratives of how films express cultural fear and anxieties about women, traditional gender relations, and she argued that rape revenge subgenre to acts to conditions the way in which common perceptions in societal word, world at large. So I want to just read her opening paragraph of her thesis. So when you're doing a thesis statement, your opening paragraph is kind of setting the tone for the argument that you want to use. And what she was going with was a a version of feminist horror. So, feminist horror films are compelling, complex cultural objects. This complexity is due to two categories that are linked together in the name, feminism and the horror genre. So as we know, there's actually not a lot of women involved in horror, and we now have Women in Horror Month of February of each year. So we are beginning to see that 
kind of birth through a little bit more. But as she's writing this article, she's talking about how interesting it is that these two concepts are coming together. So the horror genre is often thought of is superficial without any cultural relevance. Indeed, the genre is seemed to be propagated as a patriarchal perspective that offers no pleasure for or excludes a female spectator. So this has been a long growing thing that females are not catered to. And I think if you listen to any podcast and I listen to the gentleman talk about how hot women are, how great the tits were, mm -hmm. as a straight female, I can appreciate the beauty of another woman. But I do have to expose myself to constantly hearing about how men feel about the female body and yes. how attractive they think tits are and how attractive this is. You know, I don't get to listen to a podcast where I hear girls talking about guys' dicks the entire time right. or how great their six-pack is. That just doesn't happen. It is very isolating for female spectators because of that. Over the course, the category of feminism is not without its own complexity and problems. Debate about what feminism is or who feminisms are and what they believe have raged through the first, second, and third wave of feminist social movements. These two internally complex categories, as they are brought together in the genre of feminist horror, produce passionate debates not only among feminist horror fans, but within the general North American population of film viewers. I consider myself a feminist, and I've said this many, many a times. Now, there are levels of feminism, and I think that's what we fail to forget. And I also am a supporter of the Me Too movement. What I am not a supporter of is applying the Me Too, Me Too movement to every single thing, because it mm -hmm. loses the impact of the Me Too movement. So really what she's talking about here is that females have been spectators. So when we start bringing in these rape revenge films and females fighting back, it is presenting a vision of feminism, but how does it really, how do people actually view it? How do other females bring it, view it? How do males view it? So similarly, rape revenge films, which also came into their own during the 1970s, are often considered horror because of the way in which they utilize rape as an animating principle echoing the slasher genre's use of sexual elements to advance or otherwise enhance narratives. So in a slasher narrative, we see the violence, the killing, the, the cutting, all that stuff. Well, you add rape on top of that, which is a violent act in itself, or at least how it's presented in the 1970s films, it's enhancing that narrative impact of wanting to get revenge, of the fear, all that kind of stuff. Both slasher and rape revenge films are also symptomatic of a broader cultural turn during the 70s where narratives of revenge granting the female victim a much higher degree of agency. Now, if we look at the 70s film, though, as we get into a little bit later, who is actually getting the revenge? Yeah. Right. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. So the representation of sexual violence at their core offers a rich source of investigation for feminism because of which the way rape narrates are tied to the issues of gender identity. As Clover further notes in the 1970 genre film, femaleness allowed the body story to be told with a far greatest relish and the female protagonist, female rage prompt to a new energy in societal story. So what does that mean? This is one, when we see these scenes of graphic rape in Virgin Springs, Last House on the Left, I Spit on Your Grave, any human being that has healthy boundaries when it comes to sexual consent is going to watch those movies and go and be mad. They're going to be upset. They're going to be sad. They're going to be disgusted. And they're going to be very pleased when that individual gets revenge. Yep. It's going to cause that dread, that angst that you can get from a slasher film when someone is being stalked and you want them to get away. We see that violence occur and we look forward to the revenge. So this is where it begins to that empower that feminism that we're talking about. So the idea that this, this PhD student is talking about is that Starting in the 70s, we start to see the application of feminism that was going on that time coming out through these rape revenge films. So she cited a couple other pieces of work within her art, her, her thesis, because the thesis is like 50 page long, right? Like it's a very long right. documentation. So she cited um, watching rape, film and television in post-feminist culture, 
So this was an article that was written in 2001. This article, which explores the representation of rape in American films from, the 19, from 1980 to the present. So the idea is that now rape is placed in our everyday world and is not only as real physical events, but as part of our fantasy, fears, desires, and consumption practicing, practices. Watching rape tackles a different question of how representation of rape and feminism has changed over time, focusing primarily on the intersection of rape and post-feminism. So this is a really, really interesting statement. When we say things like, fears, fantasy, desires, and consumption practices. And I don't want people to read this and think, oh, someone's going to watch a rape revenge film and fantasize about doing that to somebody. That's not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about is someone seeing this film and fantasizing about somebody getting their comeuppance. We're talking about women who have had that done to them and seeing this and going, I wish I could do that. I wish someone would avenge me or having fantasies of perhaps avenging other women that have been in that situation or men watching this and dreaming about or about um, avenging other women. Now, obviously someone could be watching this and, you know, into a different kind of sexual activity and could take another kind of fantasy from it. And I'm choosing purposely not to go down that route because that's not going to be effective towards this conversation. No. Right. So the idea is that the representation of rape provides a space to bridge film analysis with real life activism in hopes of lessening the incidence of sexual violence through representation of it. So what we mean by that is a young man watches a rape film and goes, oh, my God, that's so graphic. Oh, my God, that's so, you know, violent. If we look at Last House on the Left and those rape films or I Spit on Your Grave, they're violent. They're yeah. they're humiliating. They're uncomfortable to sit through. You've said it yourself. Uncomfortable topic to sit with. So the idea is that if we present this to people that are, you know, fresh slates, because we're fresh slates when we're born, right? We learn to consent and we learn about that as we go. The idea is that someone will see this and not want to engage in it. Right. Right. It will it will build that moral compass of what is right or wrong, or also can increase people's need to talk about it right to be more open about these things happening now the only thing i would argue with that is these films like i spit on your grave last house on on the left is always very violent rapes it's over the top rapes and i'm not saying rapes like that don't happen because they obviously do but there's non cutting and slicing and dicing rapes that happen every day that are just as impactful Right. So it's it's walking that fine line. But overall, this article is very much presenting that, hey, we're bringing these issues to the limelight through film and we're trying to educate people. And if we can get more people aware that this even occurs, the better off we are. So I, I definitely applaud that message. And it really does reflect what was happening during this time. You know, if we look at the 60s, we had the creation of the birth control pill. Now, I, I don't think Scott can understand the impact of the birth control pill, but maybe for men, he will one day if that does happen for him. Because, yeah. Right? Because the birth control pill gave women the power to decide if and when they get pregnant. No longer that they need to rely on a man to wear a condom, no matter that they had to use, you know, methods like pull out and stuff like that. They were able to take a pill once a day that would prevent pregnancies. That's huge. That was huge for the 1960s. Yeah, that's really huge. Right? And it was almost saying, you are no longer just a baby-making machine. You can do more than that. So then we move into the 70s, and we start, or sorry, it's still in the 60s. We have the Equality of Pay Act in 1963. Now, we still don't have equal pay for men and women completely. But the fact that an act got put in in 1963, so up to that point, it was fine to pay a woman less because she was a woman. Mm-hmm. And owning property and stuff like that. At one time, I was talking with some of my girlfriends. You had to get a note from your husband to buy property. Really? Say that was okay, yeah. Wow. You know, like, it, we've come a very, very long way as females. And then, you, I, you know, sorry, go ahead, Scott. I, was saying, I mean, I guess that really doesn't surprise me because I have heard of old laws that were still in place in some of the states here where women had to get permission from their husbands to cut their hair. Right? Yeah, it's so that, very, very it's not surprising at all. 
Right. Like it's so, it's so fascinating how, you know, we had this rise in the sixties of women and then, you know, the bra, bra burning and other activities. And this is, we're talking about primarily in the United States and in Canada, right. That the development of these things yeah. and this, this, you know, creation of rape revenge films, like talk about, and you can look at this at two different ways. Okay. So you can look at the rape revenge film as a male figure becoming frustrated that the female is gaining more power, wanting to subdue the female through the action of rape. Yeah. And then the female rebelling back and pushing back harder. Or you can look at it as, you know, a good time slasher where this, this woman is treated unfairly and, and comes back with a bang or other people come back with a bang to get, to get justice. That's absolutely fine too. But there's no, if anything has taught me through doing this research, nothing is a coincidence. No, not at all. Right? Movies, there is a reasoning behind it. Movies are made because they reflect what's happening in pop popular culture at the time. So if we look using that feminism argument and we look at, you know, women coming into their own, as we talk about with this article, and we break down some subcategories of rape revenge films. So. I have broken down these categories. They are not made up categories from anywhere. So if you don't agree with them, that's fine. But this is what I saw after reading this article and doing a comparison. So the first category for the beginning of feminism was woman victim, others fighting. So others acknowledging that a woman has been victimized and wanting to get revenge. So the first movie I found that represented that was The Virgin Spring. Yep. From now, you've 19... seen this movie? Yes, I covered it with uh, Gary Hill and uh, Suzanne and uh, Iris on the Cinema Beef. So, what were your thoughts on this movie? What was the revenge that was gotten, or how did how did the people deal with the rape that occurred? I believe it was someone's daughter who was raped. Yep. Yeah, because this was, uh, I think, a, I could be wrong on the country, but I think it might have been a Swedish film. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's about this uh, family who has send, sends out this daughter to, I think, go pray at a far off church. And they give her, or they let their, uh, what would you call it? Like their servant or maid go with her to like just kind of keep her company, make sure she gets there okay. And she gets ambushed by these three bandits. Mm -hmm. And this film has a lot of symbolo sim symbology throughout it mm -hmm. that there's a lot more deeper meaning behind it. But like, it is pretty much what Last House on the Left is, like with the whole father finding out what happened by the fact that these people, after doing this vile act to this woman and killing her, they go to the parents' house, not realizing it's to their house. And they find out that these bandits have their daughter's handmade dress on them and the parents enact the revenge so like it yeah it has that very it pretty much toes the exact same line as last house on the left which is you know obviously more popular but like this was the first one to kind of do that and show like the grief that parent mother and father go through and what a father will do to you know put his daughter to rest and the Virgin Springs came out in 1960. So we're looking at just the beginning of the female feminism movement. Yep. And this is still very much um, young girl taken advantage of, parents find out, seek vengeance, right? We still don't see a lot of empowerment from the young lady throughout it. And then 12 years later, we have Last House on the Left. And the interesting thing about this film, first of all, Kill the Cast uh, did a review on this. So if you haven't had a chance to listen to their episode, please check it out. Um, but the girls fight back. The two main characters in this do try to fight back. Um, they try to escape. They yep. try to survive. And unfortunately, they don't in the original, I believe, right? Yes. Yeah. So, and it's very similar to the, um, La the Virgin Springs. It's a gang. They are found out by the parents, and the parents enact some very extreme body horror revenge. Yes, they for do. For 1972. Yeah, especially the mother. Yes, the mother 
does some pretty intense stuff. She bites off Weasel's penis and yeah. leaves him to bleed to death, which would be a pretty pretty painful death as a man and it's and that's almost like a demasculation which is really interesting for 1972 like when you are removing a male's penis if that male you know identifies as heterosexual or possibly homosexual or as a man in general and to remove their penis is a demasculation that's you know that's happened to females before they've had sexual organs removed as well yeah and this could also be looked at as uh taking away his weapon that he used Yes, absolutely. It's a demasculation, a removal of weapon. And because she is a woman, she is fighting back on another woman's, her daughter and the young, on the young friend's death, right? So she is, she is getting that revenge and coming full force from it. So I think that that is very, very interesting. Um, where John, the husband, manipulates Junior into committing suicide. Like, it's very interesting how that whole film comes around and the roles that people play in it. But if we look at the revenge piece of it, it's still very much the parents getting the revenge, but we're seeing more of a role from the mother in it and also some very graphic revenge yeah. in it as well. So we'll flash forward now to Death Wish 1974. So even though this isn't a horror movie, it's an extremely popular movie. And the daughter is raped, the mother is attacked, and... Paul Kersey's character goes out for revenge because he tries to go through the police methods. Everything fails. He's unable to get the revenge that he, that, or the justice that he wants to the justice to the police system. And he takes the justice into his own hands. This still happens today. <laughs> we saw that in MFA. Yeah. You know, yeah. you know, we, we haven't come that far from 1974 when it comes to sometimes justice not being had for victims, any victim of sexual assault. Yeah, and in this one, in the, in this case though, Paul Kersley, because I don't think he actually, if I remember correctly, gets revenge on the people that actually did it. Yeah, he does. He does, does he? who he hunts down. See, I thought, okay, I'm. I he be kills of, them first, I believe, and then okay. he, eventually he gets them. He kills a whole bunch of people that do wrong things. Yeah, because I was gonna say, because that's where I was gonna tie yeah. this in is where he's like starting to become like. The he's hero. a vigilante. Absolutely. Yeah, vigilante taking yeah. out people that are hurting the others. But he goes after the people that hurt his daughter okay i couldn't yeah. remember if he did or not that yeah. okay my bad no that's okay um and then i'm gonna flash forward to 2012 american mary so a uh, mary is a medical student who can't afford to stay in graduate school ends up doing surgeries underground now mind you she ends up getting raped by her professor and she actually goes to a party she gets drugged like this is a very much a i don't want to say a realistic rape but a rape that probably happens very often you know, she just shows up at this party, she gets drugged, they take her to a bedroom, they take advantage of her. The rape scene is just as equally uncomfortable, whether it's bloody or not. It's obviously very forceful. He he puts his hand over her mouth so she can't breathe at several points. And she tells, so she's befriended, um, not befriended, I guess, connected with a gentleman who owns a strip club who is equally as shady. Like, yeah. he treats women very poorly. I was talking to Scott at one point um, Mary walks in and this another woman is performing oral sex on him and he basically pushes her away and what that symbolizes is she's garbage yeah. because if we saw a woman do that well she was getting oral sex from a guy people would refer to her as a bitch but no one even acknowledges that scene of how this woman is performing head and seen as quote-unquote a whore because that's really what she's there for yeah, that's, a, that's part of the interview. She's given him a BJ and he tosses her away so disrespectfully from a, a very intimate moment. Anytime you're choosing to engage with sexual activity with somebody, it is seen as an intimate thing. Like they have your penis in their mouth. Right. <laughs> like, that's a pretty intimate act, right? So it's a, it's, he's not a stand-up character either. But anyway, she communicates what's happened and then they take revenge on the professor. So she actually doesn't go... I don't believe she goes into... Oh, no, she eventually does. That's right. So he, they bring him to her, isn't it? And yeah, I think they bring, yeah, I think they bring him to that room. And then yes, and she takes her... revenge. So it's a yeah. joint effort in taking the revenge on the individual, right? So we still see that kind of joint effort in getting revenge on the individual. So the beginning of feminism, at least stating that these activities are incorrect and appropriate. Then we move to a second stage. 
which is the person starts to take revenge. So woman victim and fighting back. So we see this first in I Spit on Your Grave, 1978. Now, I have not seen the original. I've just seen the remake. Have you seen the original, Scott? Yes, I have. It sounds very similar. It, yeah, they are very similar, though, uh, the revenge aspect. And, well, I, the rape in the remake is even more uncomfortable and over the top. Mm. Like, I think they amped up what the first one was to the extremes for the whole film. Revenge, the rape, everything. Where this one, yeah, it's uncomfortable as hell and still horrific what happens. But, like, I think the remake just kind of ramps it all up even more. Okay. Okay. It's good to, it's good to know because I haven't seen the original. For the original, it sounds a little bit more timid. Um, same thing happens. She's basically gang raped and traumatized and here though the church is involved so she ends up going to kind of pray for forgiveness about what she's going to do and that's not in the remake so i thought that that was really interesting being in um 1978 and i don't know if that's still the idea that you know she's a victim and she's she's getting the okay from the church to get revenge you know she can't have the strength to just do it on her own accord she needs to have god's blessing in order to move forward with it i don't know if that's what that means or if it was just really representing the christian culture at the time but i think that it's an interesting thought i don't know yeah. if you have any thoughts or opinions on that uh i really can't say because i don't remember that scene because it's been so long okay. since i've seen it but it's it's still the beginning that she manages to figure out how to get revenge so she sets up Matthew to have the groceries delivered she ends up killing him so she's the one that goes through the the action of the actual harm you know she may get spiritual guidance for it but she is the one that physically moves forward with the murders and then Miss 45 1981 so this one was really interesting because the rape be- revenge, the rape scenes were very random. It seemed like everywhere in New York City that this woman went, she got sexually assaulted. Yeah, all in one day. All in one day. Um, and I'm not to say that that would not happen, but it, it was very, and it was very, I don't want to say quick sexual assaults either, but it almost looked superficial and fake. To me, it did not really represent what sexual assault could look like. Um, because of the randomness of it and the quickness of it and the, and the aftermatch of it, you know, didn't seem as impactful as other films. I don't know if you felt that way or. Yeah. Um, the only thing that I took, one thing I took away from this one is Mm -hmm. we have ourselves a silent protagonist. In other words, a woman that does not have a voice. Which you can argue most women don't. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> right. that's exactly what i was thinking is what they were probably right. going with with this and that's a good point you know i think you're i think you're right on the money there and i didn't even think about that um how she empowers herself is she gets a gun and she just kind of becomes a vigilante as well and she gets to the point where it seems like she's not too selective but at the same time it's almost like a me too movie without being a me too movie yeah because it almost like the way I looked at that part was, especially towards the end, it almost became like extreme feminism where all men are bad. Yes. And she takes it out on all men at and that, that point. And that became people that uses Me Too in a way to create stronger um, divisions between men and women. The scene that I think is a, is a representation of a healthy Me Too now, I don't believe with killing somebody at the scene, but when they're at the restaurant, there's a gentleman that's being very creepy and he's hitting on them and they tell him to go away. And then he follows her and he's like, oh, come back to my photography studio. We'll have a good time. And they already saw him making out with some other girl earlier. And she goes back and she shoots him. Now, I think we can all be aware of the fact that women who engage in modeling or in New York City with, at that time probably were taken advantage of by men like that. Yeah. And so I, I think that that to me is a me, me too thing. Obviously not her shooting him in the middle of the, <laughs> though I will say when I saw that, I was like, well, I guess that's how you get stuff done from <laughs> right. a female perspective of what this guy was probably planning on doing. Um, though you never really find out for sure because nothing really happens. That is what we're talking about for me too. We're not talking about 
I go to a party, I go upstairs with my boss, because I believe she leads him upstairs to be intimate. And then while they're being intimate, she chooses to harm him. Mm -hmm. You know, that is taking it down another route because he asked her to go to the party. He, you know, that one scene, he's asked her to go to the party with him. They're watching across the office and they see a woman and man engaged in sexual intercourse in another office. He looks at her kind of indicating, like, you get the impression that he's hoping that will be him and her, which if it's a consensual activity, there's not a problem with that, right? So I think that it's very interesting in that movie how it kind of starts off where you get where her avocation is coming from to where she starts to shoot innocent people. Like when she drops, even though you see that guy trying to pick up girls and he's getting angrier and angrier that no one will respond to him on the street and she drops something, he goes to chase her to get it back to her. She becomes afraid and shoots him. We don't know ever what his intentions would have been. Right. Like, I would like to think he was just going to give her back what she dropped. Right. That's kind of what I thought when I watched that. But with his behavior earlier, do we really know that? Right. Right. So I think that that movie does a really good job. And maybe this is a movie that could be remade now. With the Me Too movement. And, like, it's not bad to have Me Too movies, okay? That's not a bad thing. It's using the movement as a way to educate, not isolate, and make men feel like shit. Like, the point of Me Too is to educate. So I think if we could make Miss 45 this year and have it bring it into modern, like, modern times and look at what really that movement means, I think we could have some really interesting um, conversations around that. So Absolutely. I completely agree. Nice. I'm glad that you uh, that you think so too, because that means I'm on the right track. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I guess we'll move to I Spit on Your Grave too. Have you seen I Spit on Your Grave too? And and do you see the similarities with Myth Forty Five? Uh, so, uh, I was like kind of, sort of, but uh, uh, like the only true similarity I've seen here was the whole uh, model being tricked by a photographer yep. in New York and the horrific things that happen here like i will be frank i stopped halfway through i have not actually finished the film okay but i got enough of the film to where i'm going all right i'm good yeah it's you 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 probably get it you're pretty you're pretty clear with it where this is a little bit more interesting is it pulls in human trafficking as well yeah so this looks at you know a, a young woman wants to be a model she gets tricked by a photographer but what happens is one of the photographer's brothers or his brothers follows her back to her house and becomes obsessed with her and tries to have intercourse with her and i believe she hurts the brother or kills the brother i can't remember because it's been a little while but the, the photographer gets mad and kidnaps her and takes her and they end up in Bulgaria and she's left in a basement on a mattress and basically used as as human trafficking men pay to come in and rape her uh repeatedly yeah this one right. is this that's why I stopped because I got I was just getting angry at this film it's it's a very hard film to watch and I think what I will commend this film for, and there's another film out there called Traffic that I can't sit through because it's too real about what human trafficking is. Yeah. And how relevant human trafficking is. Uh, a couple of years ago, my friend was involved in an organization against human trafficking, and I went to a gala to uh, support her. And I was just dating my ex-husband at the time. Like, I think we had, like, this is back in like 2010. So more than a few years ago, I guess a decade now, I just don't realize how much time has gone by. And I brought him and they showed this film about human trafficking. And it was the fucking toughest thing I've ever had to sit through because human trafficking happens like at your neighborhood mall. Yeah. (laughs) Like it's, There's a grooming stage that happens. They, you know, get basically these young girls to think that they're their boyfriends. They get them to leave home and then they become sex slaves and they keep them imprisoned or young men. 
and it's disgusting. So I do think I will applaud this film on trying to bring the human trafficking side into it. I think that's that's really, really cool that they're trying to expose that. And I shouldn't, I guess maybe really cool isn't the right word, but I think it's great that they're trying to educate people on that. Now, what's also interesting in this is that there's a female, I don't know if you got to this point, but there's yeah, a, fe- a female who you think is going to be, you know, a protagonist that ends up being part of it. Yeah. Because she was a victim of sexual assault and is now continuing the practice. And there's this one police officer that kind of thinks something is going on, is trying to figure it out. And he shows up at the end when Katie has fought back and used a vice to um, destroy a man's nuts and penis. I'm sure, I don't know if you got to that scene. Nope. Yeah, so it's a pretty graphic scene. And the police officer basically lets her go, and she makes it to the U.S. Embassy. I thought that that movie was probably pretty, to me, walked the line of more, this is what can happen with human trafficking, and I applaud them for going there. Because it goes back, and I spread on your grade three, to Katie's story, which is good because it shows the aftermath of rape and what you know, someone will go through. But I thought this one did a great job of showing rape revenge, but also talking about human trafficking. So, yeah. you know, props to I Spit on Your Grade 2 for that. And then revenge. We've talked about revenge before, um, 2017. I, I don't know how much more we need to go into it, but basically this woman goes away with her, her boyfriend and she is raped by his his business partner. Um. And some people may watch that movie and go, well, she led him on. Look how she was dancing. Yeah. So this woman. That's not the case. Exactly. Right. So automatically Scott's reaction is that's not okay, which is a very normal reaction looking for consent. Right. Yeah. But it was very much playing on that. Well, she's dressing the part. She's grinding on him and him being like, well, you showed like you liked me last night. What's the problem now? What do you mean you don't want it? You know, it's, that is a very realistic conversation that could occur now once she becomes super you know camo killer survival girl i don't know how much that transition is accurate or her surviving what she survives but if we look at that scene in general yes absolutely like yeah because you've heard the term oh well she must be asking for it because she dresses like that all the time i've had it said to me and i'm not surprised I remember, I, you know, women I, get that said to them, it's, right? Like, well, you're dressed like a slut, so you must be a slut. It's like, no, that's not the, that's not it at all. But it's interesting, right? Because women who are heterosexual are constantly trying to walk this line. So, if females watch horror movies, you know, if I listen to a podcast and they talk about how hot a girl is, she's not wearing a lot of clothes, and she's showing her body, and she's looking good, and she's being like promiscuous and stuff like that. So, if I'm like, well, I want to get a guy to like me, I guess I should do that too. Well, then you're a whore. Right. <laughs> right. So, and I'm not trying to attack any male for that. I think that that's, you know, a, a problem that we have within our society, and especially in North America, that has been cultivated through media, you know, family environments and socialized in. And I'm not pointing the fingers and blaming anybody. Yeah, it's starting to get a little better, but it's still it there. It is, right? And I think that it's, It's a difficult subject. And even as I'm talking about it, I'm like, oh, my God, how do I communicate this properly? Because, you know, as women, we want to be empowered through our sexuality if we're heterosexual. And I'm sure women that are, you know, homosexual as well or or identify as lesbian or or transgender feel the same way. I just can't speak to that because I'm not that. I'm a heterosexual female, right? So I can only speak to my own personal experience. So you walk this line of wanting to look good, but I have to think twice of ordering an Uber. I have to think twice of where I go and how is that okay? It's not, but it is what it is, right? So I think it's just really interesting that we represent Jen here, um, beautiful woman, model body, dances very sexy, you know, flirtatious, and automatically that means that, you know, she must want sex whenever, and I have every right as a man to take it. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just a really interesting concept. And of course, she gets revenge for herself, and that's why it's in this category because she empowers and fights back. Um, and that's really well done. But it's an interesting look at it. So then we get to 
telling the story of rape and the aftermath. So we move from the female getting revenge and only that. So it was really in revenge and I spent on your grave too. It ends with the female either getting into the helicopter or getting into the embassy or escaping, but you don't really see what the outcome is. You don't really see what the after effects are. So these are the movies that do that. So I spit on your grave three, Vengeance is Mine. Have you seen this one? Yes, because you ended up bringing this one up and told me it was a very interesting take. So I wanted to kind of see what it was like. And what did you think of it? Did you think from your, you know, I know that you don't have a lot of knowledge on this, but do you think it kind of showed what someone would have to do afterwards, like the therapy and stuff like that? Like, did you think it was a fair representation of... Yeah, I thought it was a pretty, like, from what I know, pretty yeah. accurate representation of what someone that's dealt with a trauma like this would have to go through and that it's not something that's ever going to go away and that this is probably a, a course they would probably, a therapy session they would probably have to take over and over and over again for a very, very long time, if not for the rest of their life. Absolutely. I, I agree with you 100%. And for someone not having, you know, not being female, um, doesn't yet again mean that men can't be assaulted and we're going to get to that in a little bit mm -hmm. um but i think it really did and i really applaud them for that i really applaud them for showing her being you know standoffish towards new people particularly men going to this group therapy group thinking that the whole touchy feeling 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 stuff is bullshit and just being angry and having these fantasies of anger because we got to remember she's committed some pretty intense murders yeah you know, I will give, I spit on your three, such pro, like I spit on your grave three. They, these are not just rape revenge films. They really aren't. They are films that explore some real issues. And I spit on your grave three, Vengeance is Mine. Yes, it has some cool kills and it has like some cool shit that happens in it, whether it's real or fantasy. But it also explores that there is some real aftermath and pain that would come from a situation like that. Like, she didn't yeah. just go back to her, like, regular everyday life. One of my biggest issues with Sleeping with the Enemy with Julia Roberts is she leaves her abusive husband and then, like, starts a new life out in the countryside and everything's fine and she's just right. living her best life. That's horseshit. Like, that's horseshit. That's not actually what would happen. So I do like, obviously, this movie is exaggerated, but I do like how it shows different types of, of sexual assault, like a young woman being sexually assaulted by her stepfather. Yep. And I like the uh, the fact that they had a father here yes. after, a, uh, after his daughter was raped and she committed suicide. Like yes. it was his way of grieving. I thought that was very well done. And his pain and his wanting to advocate. And he talks about, I got my daughter to come forward, but they couldn't get the evidence. And even with the cops that are in it, you get a real empathy for those police officers. You know, I think that the police officers that were in it cared. But I think yeah. that the justice system sometimes works, sometimes doesn't. And we have this fair due process for a reason. But there's situations like this that occur, and the victim just gets further victimized by the system. Yeah. And I want to give a shout out to 22 Shots because I know they covered all of the I Spit on Your Graves, and I strongly recommend that you listen to them for a more in depth discussion of these movies. Yeah, because they cover these these films very well they always do um and they always really bring some great insight to it so i want to shout them out and encourage people to listen to that podcast so next is a movie called una now una is not a horror film but una is about a young woman who confronts an older man at her workplace who repeatedly statutory raped her when she was a 13 year old child and the movie goes back and forth between current day of her confronting this man and what happened and it really takes a look at the sexual predator concept so this movie shows a meeting between una and this neighbor when she's a 13 year old girl how they start off friendly and then she starts seeking out him he starts seeking out her and talks about their first kiss and how they'll meet in the park and he talks about i knew it was wrong i knew i shouldn't be seeing you but i couldn't stop thinking about you and I should have stopped, I should have did this, and I didn't. And it kind of goes through back and forth of her processing this and her calling him out at his workplace. Like, this is at his workplace. So he ends up having to take her to the lunchroom, and they're having this full-out, like, 
you assaulted me, you ruined me, and she finds out that he's married, and she's like, oh, does she know what fucking woman can be with you? You're a monster. How could she love you knowing what you've done? I was a child. I was this. And it, and it's really interesting. And I'm not saying you feel empathy for him, but you almost watch him say, what I did was wrong. I went to therapy for it. I shouldn't have done these things. And like they talk about the first time they're intimate together. He leaves to go get cigarettes or go to the bar and drink. She is left alone. He comes back because they're going to go run away together and she's gone. And she hmm. thinks he left her and that he wasn't coming back. And he's like, I was coming back. You know, when I went to jail, I was sodomized to the point where I had to get a colonoscopy bag put in. Because we yeah. all know, we, we've heard what happens to individuals that sexually abuse children in jail. Yep. The movie did a great job of peeling back the, the pain that comes with statutory rape of a 13-year-old by an adult and what happens in the future to both. So he has changed his name, has a new life, because this is, she's about 28. So you're looking at this being almost 15 years later. So he's married, has a whole new life, changed his name, and she is still dealing with this pain every day. And it kind of goes through the relationship that happens. Well, not really the relationship. It's only a day. But what happens with this confrontation of what happened in the past and now? And it really does a good job of exploring that statutory rape and how it stays with the victim for that period of time and how it stays with the victimizer as well. So right. it was a very, very interesting movie. Not horror, not horror at all, um, but a, a really honest look at it. And you can find that on Netflix. Yeah, I may have to watch this one because that does sound uh, like a very interesting take on this. And it's not grass. You don't actually see the sex scene. So, and you don't see them really kissing or anything like that as, as a child or anything, um, but they describe it, right? So it does make it a little bit more easier to watch in the sense that you're not having to watch this child have sex with a 43 year old man. Um, but it does allow that discussion of the aftermatch of it to be, to be very interesting. So, and then finally we have MAF or MFA, which I covered on exploding heads. So I won't go into too much detail on it, but Noelle is an introverted California fine arts graduate student and she goes to a party and she's lured up to his room and this individual rapes her. And the rape scene is very difficult to sit through. Um, it's there yet again, <clears throat> realistic to what rape could look like. And she does all the self-help things. She tries to report it. The school doesn't want to hear about it, which does happen. Schools cover up things all the time. I know people, when we watched Black Christmas, was like, oh, no, the school would care and they would want to do more for the victim. I can tell you right now, schools cover up things. Yeah. Because they care about entrance and they care about admissions. And they and care about their... Uh... What would you, their reputation. Absolutely, right? So that's not far off. And, uh, you know, her first revenge is done accidentally. I don't know yeah. if you've seen the movie. You've seen yeah, the movie, right? Yeah, I watched it. Yeah, like she pushes the gentleman and he falls. Like it's not, she's, she's not trying to kill him. Right, she's just pushing him away. Yeah, and he falls to his death and he dies and she escapes. And then as the movie goes on, her, the, you know, the killings that she does becomes more and more intentional and more and more graphic yep and one thing i thought was interesting on this movie too was uh the scene where she goes to a former rape victim's house mm -hmm. and talk to her and tries to get her to like be more open and talk about it and she's just wanting to forget it and move past it because mm -hmm. nothing was done because these boys had uh, help from higher up powers that mm -hmm. wanted to hide. Well, they it. were athletes. Yes. Right. Yep. And I thought that was a, once again, another hard to look at, but truthful take on this. Cause there is a lot of that that goes on too. And with all three of these movies, it talks about the victim and the victimizer and the victimizer just going on and living their life. Yeah. Just going on. Oh, and then they try to say, well, my name was tarnished too. And I went through this and, and in all cases, the victims are like, not what I went through, dude. Right, like, exactly. Well, well, you did what you did was wrong. Like that's why you were that's why you were labeled a pedophile, or that's why you were labeled a rapist because that's what you did. So it's just really, really interesting how these movies, and in and in 
all, all three of them, there's revenge that's had. Una gets revenge as well because she eventually goes to this guy's house and tells his wife. Oh, okay. Right? So there is a revenge there. I would say that's probably a more realistic thing of what would happen because there's no violence. Right. It's just done with confrontation of here's what you did to me. I'm going to make your life super uncomfortable. And he find, she finds out he has a stepdaughter, which really pushes it over the edge. Oh, yeah. Right? I can imagine. And of course, he's saying, I would never do that to another girl. But, you know, it's a very, very good film. But these, these three films really take not only the revenge piece into it, but also look at what is the true aftermath. And I, and I credit these films for that. And I credit of how far we've come with dealing with sexual assault and women. Now, the key word there is women. Yeah. And I'm going to let you take over and talk about some of the things that you found about male assault. Yep. So, yeah, the I wanted to cover, because there's not a lot of films that cover this in the way that we're talking. Like, there's films, like, I'll bring up right now, Father's Day. I almost rewatched that, because I like that movie, but it's pretty much just a rapist murderer. So there's no after effects for these victims. They're just killed afterwards. So just didn't fit with what we're going with here. So what I'm kind of covering is like men being raped by either women raping them or men raping them and the cause and effect. I found an article that kind of covers a little bit of the male rape victims. And it was from irishtimes.com. And it's called, That's Men. Male rape victims suffer mentally, physically, and silently. Uh, Historically, sexual crimes against males were considered impossible or at best rare. A legacy of that attitude can be seen in a 2005 study in the UK, which found that of 40 men who had been raped, only five reported the crime to the police. Four of the five claimed the police were negative in their dealings with them. Only one complaint actually resulted in a conviction. So it's just going to show that right there that not many men want to come up and or come out and say that they have been raped. Mm-hmm. And only 14 of these men out of these 40 sought medical help after the rape. And of these, only five disclosed that they had received their injuries in a course of rape. So once again, just showing that, yeah, this is something that they just don't want to bring up to authorities or anybody that would give them medical attention. They'd much rather deal with it on their own rather than let people know what happened to them. Uh, that, yeah, most rape survivors do not receive testing for sexually transmitted diseases that they may have contracted during their rape because of this. And of the 40 men, 19 had attempted suicide after they were raped. So both men and women who are raped experience blaming of the victim by elements in society. But in the case of men, there's also a tendency to blame themselves because they failed to prevent the rape. Men also blame themselves for their psychological suffering after the rape because they believe they should have been strong enough to handle this. Mm -hmm. These imagined failures become a source of shame and make them even less likely to seek help for fear others will blame them or ridicule them. The shame derives from long-standing cultural attitudes to men about how they should be strong and able to fight off aggression and how they should be able to, quote-unquote, man up and get over violent incidents. In fact, those cultural attitudes are irrational. That doesn't stop the shame from feeling real and from keeping many men locked in a prison of isolation or worse, suffering from sexually transmitted diseases as a result of rape. Um, So, yeah, this pretty like that was the article right there but i kind of just wanted to like say like yeah these men have the ones that do get raped are afraid to come out about this Mm -hmm. like they one film like in particular that i will bring up right now it kind of summed that up perfectly is vulgar from 2002 which uh this is a story about will who is a struggling professional clown determined to make a living performing at kids parties downtrodden in every respect and picked on by everyone from the neighborhood juvenile delinquents to his own mother will reinvents himself as vulgar the transvestite clown where he performs at bachelor parties so basically his idea was i'm not making money as a child performer 
So I am going to go to bachelor parties and be hired on as they joke when they're looking for a stripper. I come out dressed in the stripper's clothing, but a male clown. And unfortunately, on his very first night out as vulgar, he ends up getting raped by three guys, and the whole situation ends up being videotaped. God, this makes me so upset, just you reading it. <laughs> yeah. Like, he, and it's very uncomfortable. And what, one thing that shocked me for this type of film was it was a View Askew film, which is Kevin Smith produced. So, you know, the guy that does Mall Rats and Chasing Amy and Silent Jane mm-hmm. and Silent Bob did a film like this. You know, that doesn't really surprise me because I feel like even in those films, Kevin Smith tries to tackle issues. Oh, he definitely does. I'm just right? surprised like, that this was something that they actually made into a movie. I, I, like, yeah. I, didn't, and I didn't even know about it. But, uh, but yeah, the reason I wanted to bring this up to tie to this is because, you know, not only is it deal with the male rape, it deals with the after effects of this. Like, after this is all said and done, Will goes home, like, the next day and, like, just pretty much uh, tries hurting himself, like, smashes his mirror, grabs Mm -hmm. a chunk of the mirror, and squeezes a chunk of the glass and just to cut himself. Yep. And then he just sits and, like, is suffering in silence in the bathtub and just, like, slowly just washing himself. And just, like, you can see that he's just trying to get clean. And all of a sudden, his friend stops by, and, you know, the friend finds out what's going on, and he's going, well, did you go to the authorities? No. Did you go to the hospital, at least? Like, you could have a sexual transmitted disease from this. No, I did not. Why didn't you do any of this? Because I don't want anyone to know what happened. And, like, that right there, when he said that statement, that, like, was very profound on, like, what a male rape victim would have going through their head. Something like this is something that, you know, they've been completely demasculated or emasculated and just shamed and humiliated to the point where like they can't confide into anybody about this. And that ends up kind of uh, as the story goes on, like he's still processing it, but he ends up rescuing a kid from a hostage situation and becomes famous and like actually is starting to become well known for being a kids TV show clown host. Mm. And then these rapists find out about him becoming famous and they blackmail him saying, we want $50,000 or we're going to release this videotape of you pretending to like what we did to you. And then it goes, brings back, like it pretty much like reopens that wound for him and that's when the revenge ends up coming in play and he actually just goes and takes matters in his own hand because obviously no one's going to believe him at this point because it's been a while and like who's going to believe someone that had that happen to him. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And he gets revenge violently, I assume. Yes. Yep, it uh, ends up being like uh, pretty much by gun but like not extreme violence like along the lines of I spent in your grave but more like realistic like violence. You know, and that sounds like a realistic situation. And it's funny that I got more uncomfortable with you talking about that than I did with the female rape. And I think the reason is, is because we've been talking about female rape since 1960. Yeah. We have not been doing a good job in society as talking about male assault. No, like it's... Or rape or whatever you want to use. And part of the issue, too, is it's joked about a lot. It is. Like, you look at the movie Horrible Bosses, and I know there's going to be people listening to this rolling their eyes at us, and that's fine. But whether we want to admit it or not, what Jennifer Anderson's character is doing to Charlie's character is not okay. No. She's trying to blackmail him and ruin his marriage. Like, there was upcoming marriage, right? So, and that's fine. You may listen to this and go, you know what? I bang that chick. And that's fine. That's cool. But that just because you would doesn't mean this other person wants that and wants their life ruined. Yeah. Cause he did not want anything to do with her. He pushed yep. her away multiple times. And mm-hmm. I, if I remember correctly, didn't she end up gassing him and pretty much raping him? Yeah. It, or framing something that something happened. Cause I don't think he was able, probably certain oh, probably. things were not able to become aroused. Right. Uh, that's true. But she, you know, made videos of her on top of him 
and you know it be it was a comedy right and i and if you find that co- funny i'm not you know i find it funny too i watched the movie and i laughed i'm not this is not about scott and i judging anybody who no. found that funny but what we're trying to expose here is that this is a topic that's not brought up yeah, and, and this brought it up in a way that was very effective yeah and like i was saying about like it's joked about a lot is uh, this gets brought up in hundreds of movies mm-hmm. the whole you're gonna go to jail and someone's gonna make you their bitch Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and it's just joked about or like a threat mm-hmm. and so like it, yeah like but like the real repercussions of what happens doesn't get talked about very often absolutely true and like i just found that film like because i'd watched it when i first like started watching like dvds so like back in like 2000 or something like that i came across it and i watched it and didn't think anything of it like that that had that type of impact, but then rewatching it for this and looking for these uh these particular topics, man, this one hit home with me really hard. Like I just couldn't believe like some of the dialogue that was brought up into this felt so real. And, and you know, Kevin Smith is good at making real dialogue. I yeah. I he really is. And I <sighs> Yeah, I'm really glad you shared this because it was it was the first conversation we've had throughout this entire entire thing that made me uncomfortable, and that's right. important. You're not growing if you're not uncomfortable. And, right, exactly. You know, even if this podcast today made you a little bit uncomfortable, I'm okay with it <laughs> for the listeners because it means that you're growing and it means that you're looking at things from a different perspective, and that's what we're trying to do here. Yep, exactly. And like, I'm going to move on to another film that I had recently watched that covers like the situation kind of in horrible bosses in a way except not used as a comedy yeah um so this one would be like share follow which came out in 2017 this one is about a youtube star that you know like in the age of youtube like these are stars they Mm -hmm. get thousands to possibly millions of viewers and There is one woman in particular that takes a liking to this guy to the point of stalking that she will, she ends up moving to the state he's in and pretending to be uh, working as a male lady. And once she gets his address and everything, she pretty much cons him into going on a first date because one of his rules was, I will never get involved with any one of my fans. He's like, I love all of you. I'm not going to do that. That is not fair to anybody. Well, she's one of those fans that took it too far, tricked him, went on a date with him without him knowing who she really was because there was no face to her, just her voice. And she sleeps with him. And after she sleeps with him, she confides in to him that, oh, yeah, I was, uh, I'm so-and-so. And he freaks out naturally and kicks her out of his house. And she just becomes more and more dangerous as a stalker, calling him constantly, messaging him constantly, uh, following him places. And finally he's like, you know what, maybe I'll break this rule and I'll try this with her just to see where this goes because she seems like a nice lady. Well, she ends up, when he tells her this, he's out doing something and he comes back. She's inside his house and in his bath waiting for him. So stalker level to the extreme, breaking into oh, his house. I'm going to pause for just a second. Let's reverse it. That was a female. That was a dude. They never would have got to that point. Oh, yeah. Right? Absolutely. And I think it's funny that he decided to go on a date with her because she was so persistent. She was stalking and misled and lied to him. Yeah. You know what I mean? But he felt as a male, oh, she's being assertive and wants to be with me so badly. I should give her a chance. Like talk about double standards for men, right? Oh, it so is. And it's not fair for them. Yeah. Yeah. And then like, this is the pretty much around the scene where she ends up drugging him and uh, fucking him. Cause like he freaks out and says, this is not okay. Like when he finds her in the house and like basically tells her to get out of there. And then she's like, well, just, I'm sorry. Let's go get a drink. And we'll talk about this like humans and, or like, like adults. And she mm-hmm. drugs his drink. And when she drugs his drink, like it wasn't enough to where obviously he couldn't get aroused, but she, and the, like, he was still somewhat conscious, but not 
faculty not there mm-hmm. with his own mind and she ends up videotaping it <laughs> and then she ends up sharing it on the interweb after she pretty after he pretty much finds out what she did he kicks her out of the house he calls the cops cops are just like huh this this happened really i don't buy it we'll look into it just as a courtesy but we don't buy this and he's telling his friends like that he got raped and his friends are just go like his guy friend was just like dude she's hot good for you and he's going no this is not cool this is not real and then they went online and when everybody online seen it all the dudes are like yeah good for you way to get some blah 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 and it just shows like that yeah there is that double standard where women a woman rapes a guy especially a very attractive woman like the guy doesn't get believed or gets treated like oh well you got laid by a hot chick oh how how horrible right and that's and not the case and and we're and you know we could have people listening to this podcast that's like i'd be fine with that and that is fine that's okay that you would be fine with that what we're yeah. talking about here is not everybody would be yeah, because exactly. you don't know what this woman has she's now videotaped you what if this guy was in another relationship or he just said no men are allowed to say no too right <laughs> And I think that that is what we're trying to get through for the layers here, that if the reverse had happened and that had been a female, the outcry would have happened early, early, early on. Yep. And that guy would have been arrested. Right. But because it was a female on male, it's the same way with abuse. You know, I have witnessed with some of my fellow friends being with females that have slapped them, that have gun shit to them that they shouldn't physically or emotionally or or verbally abuse them and it's seen as well that's just girl power like girls slap a guy and it's sometimes encouraged by other women and other people but it's actually never okay to physically hit anybody no like i'm not talking about defending yourself i'm talking about slapping a guy because you don't like what he said that's actually not okay no absolutely not right and or or punishing someone emotionally because they won't do something that you want them to do that's not okay either male or female and i think that's what this film is trying to get at yeah it is right like it is a film that i think should should be watched just for so you can understand like a level that like through the male eye perspective like of this type of situation well or how we treat it in society you know i If a man, any male, heterosexual, homosexual, transgendered, whatever it may be, consent is consent. Yeah. You know, and that's what these films are trying to present, is that consent is consent. It's not dependent on your sex or your sexual orientation. Right, exactly. (laughs) And, I mean, we were talking about it before the show, before we decided to record the show and if I was going to bring it up. But, yes, I've been a victim of a sexual assault because of non-consent yep i was not raped but i very well could have been um because yeah it was pretty much a uh shortly after my divorce i started going out on dates trying to get myself back out there try to remember how what it's like to be dating uh met this girl on a dating site we went out for a few drinks she invited me back to her place and you know, one thing led to another. We were in bed. And then she was like, you know what? I know what guys like. And I'm going to do this. And I'm, she starts stabbing me with her fingers and pressure points around my groin. It hurt so bad that I screamed out loud. And she didn't stop. She kept doing it and kept doing it. And she actually got frustrated because I wasn't getting up. You weren't becoming aroused from the beginning. Yeah, Yeah, I wasn't getting aroused, and she was getting pissed. And so she ended up just rolling over and going to bed. When she passed out, I slowly got up, put my clothes on, got the hell out of there. Mm -hmm. And there was a few friends I talked to about it. They were just like, sounds like a good time to me. It wasn't. It was a very unpleasant, uncomfortable experience Mm -hmm. that I Mm -hmm. I don't wish upon anybody else. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, and it could have been a lot worse, but it, like, it could have been. And the fact that, you know, you're comfortable with telling that story, Scott, that takes a lot of courage because 
you had something done to you that didn't feel right and that you didn't want. And, you know, if you were hanging out with a buddy and he was punching you on the shoulder and you were like, okay, man, that's enough. And he kept punching you and punching you, punching you to the point that it bruised you. You'd be like, what the fuck, dude? <laughs> like I right. said, no, stop. Right. Why didn't you stop? And it doesn't make it okay that a female does that to you. Right. And th- right. I was actually bruised in those spots where she pushed because she was pushing so hard. You know, and I think that this is an area of horror and horror has always been a advocate of social issues. Like we, ca- we go back to the last house on the left and looking at feminism, right? And we, and we tie that all together. By you sharing the story today and us looking at Vulgar and like, follow, share, um, I probably will touch a little bit on Knock Knock and I'll talk a little bit about, you know, the slasher season, though you've already done such a good job of describing it. Basically, the slasher TV show um, was, a, was a TV show on Netflix. It was a Canadian show. And the second season, a uh, main character named Noah is raped anally um, by one of the characters. And the aftermath of it is is painful to watch because he is he is he is bleeding from his anus profusely. He is crying uncontrollably. He is in a shower, unable to get out. He's he the one character is trying to clean him, and it is painful to watch. Um, you know, and it's exposing he is he has been violated in a way that is not okay for anybody to be violated. Right. Not okay. But I applaud them for using a man because I I think that this is still a subject area where we have our your your I spit on your grave and mfa and una and women fighting back and here's the therapy and stuff like that and then we have situations like this in your story like what if this individual has done stuff like that to other people or what if you know like share follow that probably happens or women that are abusive towards men like we're not talking about it and i think these horror films are beginning to talk about it they're far and few yep. in between, but we're at least getting there. And that's what's so great about horror. It's about moving things forward in society and not being afraid to take on the big, the big issues. Yeah, because horror does tackle a lot of taboo subjects. And that is one thing that makes me proud to be a horror, fa- horror genre fan, because they do cover these topics in some ways that people would not expect if they just looked at it as a like simple horror film. But when mm-hmm. you dig down deep, you see a lot of these layers of storytelling and bringing forth real topics that are happening in society absolutely absolutely okay so yeah i'm going to talk about knock knock which is a believe a remake of a movie called death games which i did not get a chance to see before we recorded but this is uh stars keanu reeves who is a father that is uh a father or father and a loving husband his wife and his kids have to leave for Father's Day week or are going on vacation for Father's Day weekend. And their, their gift to him was pretty much, you know, here's the house to yourself. Get your work done that you need to get done because he's, like, he's an architect. And we'll give you the time and space to do that. And we'll be home in a couple of days. And while he's at home working by himself, it's just downpouring. And he gets a knock on the door late at night. And it's these two beautiful young women drenched from head to toe and they say like you know their car broke down could you uh could we happen to use your phone or can we use your website to get an uber or your internet so being the nice guy is he allows them in lets them dry off uh brings them a towel gets them a cup of coffee and he calls them an uber well they're constantly talking like sexual things and just like being somewhat flirtatious with him and you can tell he's awkward and he's moving away and just like because they'll come and sit right next to him and kind of sandwich him in and Mm. he'll get up and move to another chair and just sit down and just like be polite and talk with them and then they're like all right well do you mind if we use your shower because before the uber gets here he's like no go ahead and he stays down and they're getting the shower and he gets the notification the uber arrives so he calls up for them 15 minutes go by and Still nothing. So he goes up and knocks on the door, bringing him towels just in case they need them. And they said, oh, we're fine. Come on in. And he opens the door and they're both butt naked and instantly both latch onto him, trying to like seduce him and make out with them. And he's like pushing them away. Like, no, I can't do this. I can't do this. And he's like, your ride is here. Here's your clothes. Get dressed. And they keep pulling him in. And 
unbuckling his pants and then he just kind of gives in to them. And then he wakes up the next day realizing what he did, completely defeated, and then the women are act even wilder and start becoming obnoxious and like destroying stuff in the house. And then they tie him up and uh, pretty much say, you're going to fuck my friend right here or we are going to call your wife while you're tied up and FaceTime her with us naked or with us in scantily clad clothes with you naked right next to us. And so he ends up giving in and ends up fucking his fr- uh, her friend. And he gets videotaped and it ends up getting posted to Facebook at the end of the movie. Mm. And ruining his life and his career. Which, yeah, this one doesn't have like a lot of the aftermath effects because it pretty much stops right there once the video gets shared. But you can imagine like what would happen after all this was said and done because he's left alive, but now his life is destroyed because family and friends have seen what has gone on in the By video. By sexual predators, because that's predation, yeah. right? Like, that's what that is. Yeah, so I thought that would be a, it was kind of a fitting one to bring into this topic as well. Just because it kind of covers that and it shows like even when a guy says no over and over and over again, like sometimes like that pressure is there that he ends up just kind of giving in. Absolutely. And I think the thing can can be said for women. Women may say no, no, no. And then the guy, oh, come on, come on. Or, you know, woman to woman, man to man. And then things happen. Now, we didn't go into um, the LGBTQ, um, LBGQ community or we as much. Uh, There is a film, Knife Heart. Knife plus heart yep. that does cover that a little bit. We also didn't talk about hard candy as well. Oh yeah. Um, and there was uh another one that dealt with like incestual rape, and that would be uh Strange Things About the Johnsons that Ari Aster did a short film on. Absolutely, and also the Shrewd's Nest, you can argue as well, is another one yep. that looks explores that. There's a lot of movies that explore it. Um and we and we particularly chose these films only because we don't want to have a five hour podcast. And they were the ones that made the most sense for us for this topic um, and that we felt the most comfortable talking about and referring to. So I think really, you know, thanks for coming on the ride with us. We know it wasn't an easy listen, but if anything, I think what we can take from this is the power that horror and movies can have to explore issues and to educate us and to promote. And as we saw with the argument about horror bringing around this new sense of feminism, I think we can see the same thing happen for all communities and all sexual orientations and everybody of learning about the truth of consent and what is okay and not okay. um, And really no longer blaming the victim, whoever the victim may be. And horror does a a good job of either that victim coming back and kicking ass and taking names, but also is moving forward to talk about the aftermath of it. So, you know, really some big props to yet again, the podcasters in the community that have covered these films before and the horror filmmakers in general, who knows where we will go with this genre as it continues. We'll always get some cool kick-ass kills in these films. We'll always get some great gore. We'll get that, you know, awesome protagonists that we love and those fucking awkward scenes that we got to sit through and uncomfortable scenes, but who knows where horror will educate us from here. So you know, I look forward to seeing how we can continue to build advocation for the victim through horror. Yeah, because they will, because the, the more this stuff gets talked about, the more horror will talk about it in its own way and bring it more to the forefront. Because it does seem to be one of the leading reasons for a lot of stuff getting brought to the forefront, at least in cinema. Absolutely. Absolutely. So yeah, so, so we'll finish this off on a lighter note. <laughs> yeah. So thank you all very much for sitting through this with us. This was a tough subject to cover, but I'm glad that we did. It was uh, something that should be discussed and like having a male, female perspective point of view on it probably is a different take. So hopefully you all appreciate what we did. Um, So we're going to talk about our out of the dark segment, which is a topic that we're a new segment of ours that we are going to cover some type of horror news or horror related topic. And the topic we wanted to bring to the table today was uh, the horror hound uh, convention. It was a, uh, it's been a convention for quite a few years. I think there was one in Indiana and Cincinnati and another place. And they usually end up doing them like one in each city, like 
once every couple of years or once or twice a year. However, thanks to COVID, uh, they've had to push it back, push it back, and now they've had to cancel it just because they can't afford to keep doing this. So what they ended up doing was they ended up creating a digital film festival where you are able to pay $15 for one, one time payment of 15 bucks to watch all the different short film and full length feature films that were entered into their film festival that you would see at their convention. And it started on Wednesday at like 6 p.m. to midnight uh, and went on to Thursday. It's going on Friday night, Saturday night, and ends on Sunday. So you got like 30 hours or so of new short films and full length films that have no one's gotten a chance to see yet. And all you got to do is pay 15 bucks and watch the stream live. And uh, so far, uh, we are recording on Friday. So it's only been two days of the convention or the film festival going on. I got to catch a good chunk of the Wednesday night one. Uh, did you get to catch much, Heather? Not on Wednesday, no. I watched Thursday. I saw a couple short films on Wednesday and then uh, some stuff on Thursday. Okay. And what did you think? You know what? I think that it's a really exciting to see films like this being made because it really shows some of them are obviously very low budget, which is fine. It's a film festival, but I almost feel like I'm getting a sneak peek into the behind the scenes and watching the film festival films. Now being someone that's watched more movies, I have a lot more appreciation for the work, the time, the energy that goes into creating these films, you're going to see a lot of films that are really good and you're going to see films that maybe aren't your cup of tea or just not as well made as you thought they could be. But it really exposes to what could be coming and oh my god, what an opportunity. Where else yeah. would you find something like this for $15 to have access to films from all over the world and these are films that, you know, we could be raving about next year. Right. Or a couple of years from now, because some of these films, like some of the films at festivals don't make it out for a couple of years till they find distribution. Right. It's to me, it's like getting a, a seat on something special. And $15 is nothing to pay for all of the access that you get and there's a chat room too so you can chat with people about the films as you're watching them yeah and hell i paid 15 bucks and i've watched one full-length film and like three short films and right there that was worth the money like if i stopped now i would not be disappointed if i that i spent 15 bucks and, and we'll be watching it sunday we'll be sitting down and watching a lot of the film festival together on Sunday because um, Sunday Scott and I usually watch new movies anyway, but we'll be watching the film festival, obviously. Um, and that will be worth it alone. Right. Like it's just such a, it's a gift. Like I, uh, there's a couple of things about 2020, you know, people keep shitting on 2020 and I get it. Okay. COVID sucks. We all know COVID sucks. All right. We all are fucking aware of the fact that there's a virus that sucks. But there has been so many blessings that have come out of this. You know, I see more people outside being physically active to start off with. I've seen a stronger online community develop. We've had more VOD releases. I've been watching more VODs that I probably never would have watched otherwise. Right. And we have something like this. Like, I'm excited for this. Yeah, because this has gotten uh, certain companies and events to think outside the box. And what a amazing opportunity for these independent filmmakers to not only just have the people that would be at the convention see their films, but with this, it's given the almost the whole entire world an option to see their films. Because now, not, now you don't have to go just to the convention to see their movies. You can watch them from the comfort of your home. Like me, all the way in little old Canada, you know, I... I'm able now to watch a film festival that would be in the United States that I would have to cross the border, transfer my money into American, find somewhere to stay. Yeah. Like, and it then... is not easy for Canadians to go to the States. Our dollar is worth significantly less. And even going to see Scott is a budget for me. And I stay with him and he feeds me. <laughs> 
that right. I still have to factor gas and time. And, you know, we do go out and see movies or the conventions and stuff like that. And my dollar sucks. I still have bills to pay. Like nothing's changed. It's just my dollar blows compared to the American dollar. So I think something like this and, you know, you can buy a, a, a Funko Pop for $15 or you can you can get a five day film festival. Like it's a no brainer to me. Yeah, absolutely. And <laughs> like, and what I want to discuss is like, would you like to see this going forward with other conventions? Well, like, I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> like, I mean, <laughs> well, I mean, obviously, I mean, I should say actually, obviously, we want to see this going forward. Yeah, but, I'm just uh, teasing you. Do you think that others will take notice of this and go forward? I think with it, it depends how much money this makes. I think, um, I think COVID nineteen or this virus, you know, I think I, at first I thought it, this was just going to be another virus like SARS and swine flu and everything. And I don't think that anymore. I think this virus isn't what's going to change. It's our activities that are going to change. Yeah. You know, physical distancing and the changes that are being implemented in businesses and social events, you know, it's going to make it harder for larger groups to gather. Yeah. And I think that these online methods of getting lots of people to watch it and also for distribution sake, what if I'm, you know, a film company up here in Canada and I watch a film and I'm like, oh shit, I'll pick I'm that up. All these guys. Yeah. Right. Like why would you not want that exposure? It's a win for horror fans. Cause we get to see what's coming down the pipe. It's a win for the filmmakers. It's a win for the festival. Cause it puts your festival on the map. So like if you're part of a convention and the festival is there and I see this festival and I go and I look at your convention, I go, oh shit, that looks really good. Maybe I end up going to your convention. Like, Yet again, it's how I feel about horror movies. We, it's not like we need less people watching horror. Right. This makes things more accessible for people. And in our community, our little, our little horror community alone, at least four of us, or, or five of us, have purchased tickets for this festival. Yep. And when you're watching the stream, you can see how many people are watching up in the corner. Uh, at one point during that full-length feature, we were up to 120 people. Now calculate that into like fifteen dollars a ticket. That's almost two grand. Yep, and that doesn't count who wasn't watching who bought a ticket. Right, exactly, and like, and that doesn't count like Canadian dollars for you because I know it was like almost what double the price. Um, yeah, I'll get it on my credit card statement soon enough, but it will probably be about probably close to thirty. Yeah, so like, yeah, different yeah. countries, like how much people are spending on this, like. But yeah, just to, like I bet you with the weekend, like Memorial Day weekend, uh, there will probably be a way more viewers even. It's so smart, you know, and I don't see any downfall with it. I see zero negativity. All I see is positivity. And I think we need to start being more positive. You know, yeah. um, Dave C made a really good point on exploding heads a couple weeks ago yet again we blow exploding heads. But, <laughs> um, he said something like everyone just bitches about COVID and you know what? It's true. COVID fucking sucks. Okay. We all get it. All right. Yeah. Shit's been canceled. You know, we all fucking get it, but here is something that's great. Here is something that is a real opportunity. So let's celebrate it. And you know, if you don't want to do it or not, that's fine. You know, I haven't heard anyone shit on it or anything like that, but this is a positive thing that's come out of it. So let's celebrate that. Yes, this was a way for a convention to get creative and yep. like bring attention to them and hopefully help cover some of the cost of everything that's happened. Absolutely. And, yeah, and then once again, what a wonderful, wonderful thing for these little independent filmmakers, like to have so many people watch their movies that may not have seen them normally. It's just all around, it's, I think, a excellent idea that I think other horror cons should consider doing. I agree with you 100%. And I think we'll start to see that. I'm wondering if TIFF will go online, um, the Toronto in International Film Festival. Yeah. It would be interesting if it does, because, man, I will <laughs> I'll pay. That'll be in Canadian, so I'll be even happier. But, like, um, I'll pay whatever it is for sure. It's it's exciting times. Yeah, because uh, there is also South by Southwest. I think they released uh, 20 of their films on Amazon. Like, in, you had to pay a certain amount for it, but. I think that was kind of the start of it where we're starting to see festivals kind of take this route. Yeah. Looking outside the box, right? That's what, that's what it's going to come down to. 
Yep, I would say during these stressful times, this forces people to get forces people and companies to get creative, and we'll probably see a lot of these changes like stay. Absolutely, absolutely. And so, yeah, we just wanted to kind of bring that up. Like, unfortunately, by the time you guys hear this episode, the Horror Hound uh, Weekend Film Festival will be probably over with. But you know, hopefully, some of you had got a chance to like see it. I posted the link on our Facebook page, so hopefully, some of you took advantage of that as well. Uh, so yeah, this is just something that I thought was really cool that we should talk about. So thanks for bringing it up, Scott, and we'll probably lead to the closing of our episode now. I don't know what our next topic's going to be. Um, I'm probably going to make Scott pick it. So yeah. whatever Scott decides is what we're going to talk about next. So um, we'll see. We'll see what Mr. Crawford decides that he wants to do for our next topic. But in the meantime, take care of yourselves. Uh, please see our links and stuff below. And as always, unpleasant dreams. <laughs>